tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Debbie Sanderson was a dream come true. At five foot nine, with a quick wit, perfect smile, and the deepest brown eyes I'd ever seen. We'd met on a Discord server about two months back and really hit it off. Our conversations evolved from messaging to phone calls and video chats. She seemed like everything I'd ever wanted. Our only obstacle was distance. She lived in Colorado and well, I didn't. I'd always wanted to go, but I could never justify the trip. I hated to travel alone. But when Debbie invited me out to visit, I couldn't help but jump at the opportunity. My motives weren't all of a romantic interest, though. I knew Colorado had some of the finest recreational activities that aren't what you'd call legal where I'm from. My friend Colleen recently moved there and said there was everything you could imagine. Cannabis popcorn, gummies, brownies, basically anything and everything you could ever want to put pot in had, well, pot in it. GPS would take me anywhere that I needed to go, hotel-wise and such. After a lot of research, extra shifts to save up money, and planning with Debbie, my room was booked and my itinerary planned. I wanted to be as best prepared as I could be given the spontaneity of my new surroundings and people. It was about an eight-hour drive, and though I dislike solitude, I can handle road trips or a weekend by myself, if... I knew there was company at the other end. Even so, I was anxious about the solitary venture until I crossed the border into Colorado, and the landscape changed. Then, I was thankful for my decision. The view outside my window was utterly breathtaking, and the time spent alone in the open air on the I-70 was just what I needed. The windows were as far down as I could stand, the air freezing on a level I simply wasn't used to, but the cold made me feel alive. I listened to my best of the oldies playlist on the drive. And as the last notes of good vibrations faded out, I'd reach my destination. The timing was perfect, as if the Beach Boys were foreshadowing a life-changing experience. But the Beach Boys hadn't met Debbie. Despite having the body of a goddess and eyes like midnight, the poor woman ended up being a total dud. She introduced me as an old family friend to her neighbors. Her house was an ungodly mess. She actually jumped the first time I put my hand on her leg. Around the time that I started to wonder if maybe I'd been catfished, I also realized that in the end it didn't matter. There was no chance we would ever work out. But the end didn't mean we couldn't have some fun before I left. She took me to her favorite dispensaries and restaurants. We drove about 70 miles out of town so she could take me on the road that the opening to my favorite Netflix show was filmed on. So many edibles were sampled. Popcorn, brownies, candy, you name it. Try as I might, I just couldn't get her to break out of her shell. Even after elevating our minds. Out of all the things in God's universe to talk about, we ended up discussing climate and gas price differences. She was a pretty woman, and online she had one of the deepest minds I'd ever spoken to. I really tried to ignite a spark before I finally cut my losses, but in the end, it was lighting a match underwater. I was grateful for the trip in more sense than one, but sadly, if I never saw Debbie again, it wouldn't make any difference to my life whatsoever. She was nice and all. She was polite and interested in what I had to say. I could tell a few times she attempted to be flirty, but it just wasn't fully executed for whatever reason. By the time I left, I could tell that she fully understood, possibly even felt the same as I did. I could tell in her movements that she couldn't wait to get away from me at the end there. So, 
Once I'd made adjustments to my trunk and purchased a few new things from the closest dispensary for the ride home, I was ready to go. I'd accomplished all I had set out to do except fall in love, of course. There was nothing left for me in Denver now that I was done with Debbie. I checked out the next morning and I returned onto the I-70 and headed towards Summit County. There was only one more thing I had to do before I left the state for good. It was early morning, the first blush of sunlight just yawning in the sky, and Copper Mountain towered over the horizon. It looked just like a Bill Alexander painting. I remember promising myself I was going to try to paint it in the first week that I was home. Pictures certainly wouldn't do it justice, but it was impossible to behold and not capture on film. As soon as I saw it, I was instantly in love. Snow-kissed mountain peaks rose higher than the clouds, their tops kissing the sky in private where no one could see. I'd toyed with the option of taking Debbie with me before we'd actually met. I dodged a bullet on that one, I guess. After the first evening, I'd made my mind up not to mention it at all. Deep in the mountain shadow, I pulled over, turned the car off, switching the camera over to the music app on my phone. I wanted to remember this vision till the day I died, absorb every feeling, emotion, and smell. I felt so small in the grand scheme of things compared to this massive landscape. i truly never seen anything like it. I queued up my mountainside playlist and spaced out, floating on the lingering waves of my last buzz. I leaned back in my seat and stared at the mountain as the vibrations of the music carried me away to the meditative beating of my own heart. A soft and peaceful rhythm comforted me as I reclined my front seat to get a better look at the sky. I ashamedly must have dozed off because according to my phone, about an hour later, a sudden shockwave had jolted me out of my trance. The percussion of Pink Floyd's welcome to the machine flooded from my phone's speakers warping the flow of my thoughts until my pulse became anxious and erratic. The mountain had disappeared beneath a growing cloud of thick white flurries. The snow was so pure and the movement so immensely consistent that it was hard to see at first. Snow rained down the crags of the mountain like waterfalls, and an alarming amount of it was invading the road faster than I could process. My fingers yanked the handle to raise my front seat back up. I fundled with my keys in an attempt to reverse my car and get out of the path of danger. I was pretty sure the avalanche wouldn't reach me, but I wanted to be safe. The engine responded with a string of disheartening clicks. The siren at the end of the song reached its crescendo right as the avalanche caught up with me, slamming into the car like a wall of pristine white cement. My head bounced off the driver's side window and then there was nothing, no sound, no light. Only the thick black emptiness of my unconscious mind. I awoke sometime later to a plaintive beeping sound in the darkness of my entombed car. My phone, low battery. It was at an unhealthy 3%. I didn't care. My head hurt too much. I pressed a hand against the throbbing pain and my fingers came back red. Once again fighting with my keys, I attempted to restart the vehicle but was met with the same result as before. Each empty click of the engine inching me closer towards a panic that cut through the fog of my injury. I frantically pulled at the door handle, beating the paneling with frustration until my hands were numb. Absolutely nothing happened. It felt like the entire car itself was locked in place. Like the cuts had never been made for the door panels, and it was a solid piece. There was, there was no way out. Intrusive thoughts began to rain down on my anxious mind. I was alone. I was trapped in a dead car and no one knew where I was. But I had hope. I wasn't the only one to have traveled that road. I just prayed the county would come out soon to close the road and clear it, digging me out in the process. Hours passed. Silence pressed against me, as physical a presence as the cold itself and the air only grew colder. 
the longer I sat there. Before I knew it, my breath was visible to the eye, even in the dark. And I'd started to shiver uncontrollably. The snow must have buried me deep to have turned my car into this sensory deprivation chamber from hell. With no external stimulation but the cold. It didn't take long before my heart was racing and my thoughts were spiraling into a pit of negativity and death. The frozen sweat of an anxiety attack was approaching fast, so I did the only thing that made sense at the time. I packed a pipe I had hidden away in my glove compartment. Upon meeting flame to glass, the red hairs of a nugget danced in anticipation. I inhaled in an attempt to push away my rising panic. At first, it worked. The smoke was warm and it didn't take long before I found myself caught up in the flowing upholstery on the ceiling. My trembling worries replaced with a newfound confidence of a rescue assured. The snow couldn't be this thick forever, I thought. Eventually, it would thin out enough for my car to be visible and then I'd be saved. But then it started to wear off and paranoia set in. I was too keenly aware of my solitude. Everything around me was so still and quiet. The only thing I could focus on was the deafening beats of my panicked heart. It was just me, my breathing, and, and the silence. The isolation tested my sanity, gripping my heart with a sudden terror I know could exist. A familiar discomfort churned in my stomach. Dread. I realized it wasn't cold anymore. There, in the depths of my icy coffin, a surge of warmth had enveloped me. It started at my toes and steadily made its way up through my body. Before long, I was burning up and the urge to take off my clothes was irresistible. My mind quickly lost all semblance of rationality after that, as song lyrics echoed through its recesses. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Two can be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. It had to have been at least 24 hours since I'd been trapped in the car. Not that there was any way to tell. My car was dead. My phone was dead. The only thing left with any life in it was me. And that wouldn't be true for much longer if no one found me in the next 24 hours. I was trying my damnedest to keep it together while the claustrophobic confines of my prison ground away my sanity and my feet were on fire i couldn't feel my toes themselves just the licking of phantom flames tempting me to remove my socks luckily my fingers were past the point of cooperation but i still couldn't tolerate the heat it was a struggle but between fear and panic i'd eventually lost the fight against rationality I removed my shoes and wrestled off my socks. Then, just on the edge of my perception, I heard something. A series of whirs and whips or air sounded through the layers of metal, glass, and snow. My heart leapt at recognizing the sound of tires on pavement. Hope reinvigorated my spirit more and more with each car's passing. The road must have been cleared, I thought, and leaned closer towards the frozen window to listen. Instantly, I recognized the scraping sound of steel against pavement. My eyes filled with tears, bringing the unexpected comfort of warmth to my cold eyes. It was the sound of a snowplow approaching rapidly in the distance, and I realized that it was closing in on me. To them, I just looked like a clump of snow, accumulated from the earlier avalanche. They'd have no idea of knowing a car was underneath there until it was too late. 
I held my breath and braced myself for the impact. A torrent of force rocked my vehicle. Then I was moving, but not forwards or backwards. The car was traveling down, falling. I was fortunate enough to have it land right side up. A rush of heat flew to my brow, and a crimson liquid trickled into my eyes. As I rushed to wipe it away, a smear of blood shone on the steering wheel, letting me know I must have whacked my head when the car hit bottom or wherever the hell I ended up at. My temples throbbed. As multiple thuds of snow pounded a few feet outside my window, before going distant again as the snowplow drove past, abandoning me in all hopes of immediate rescue. I must have gotten turned sideways in the avalanche and was probably buried even deeper. With the snow piled up by the plow. If so, my thinking is that this would most definitely be the last thing my eyes saw before I died. That was it then. I couldn't think of anything else to do but sit and hope the snow would melt enough for my car to be visible before I became hypothermic and either froze to death or died of exposure. No. After a few moments of self-pity and awaiting death to get it over with and take me, I decided to refuse to let this be how it ended. I needed to think. This shithole car was not going to be the last thing I saw in life. I looked around, desperate for an answer. But between the constant throbbing and the rising panic, thinking was hard. So I reached for some comfort to make it easier to focus. The zipper of my backpack filled the silence of my would-be tomb with a thunderous growl. No matter how slowly I pulled, it jarred my senses but a cautious swirl of my hand inside the bag, careful not to make too much noise, brought me the container I sought. The label read, Jedi Haze. This ought to be good, I thought. Despite the warmth I felt, my hands shook from the cold, spilling some herbs as I tried to empty out the dead embers from earlier and pack the glass pipe. Lighting it was agony. Each tiny spike of the wheel felt like needles jabbing in my ill-circulated skin. However, the more I smoked, the more scenarios leading to my death faded from my mind. It took a few minutes, but eventually my mind cleared and I knew I needed to get it together and come up with a plan. If I was going down, I was going to go down swinging. However, I was overconfident and ignorant that I'd been slowly running out of air. My lungs burned as they filled with smoke, and soon I was hacking up a storm. Jedi haze wasn't very smooth for something so expensive, but who cares about money now? If this is the last thing I do in life, then I guess it was worth it. I needed a drink. When was the last time I had something to drink? I did a quick mental search of the contents of the car. Why didn't I keep bottles of water with me? Then I remembered Debbie always had a bottle on her, which meant there should have been a bottle still hiding in my trunk. I carefully crawled into my back seat, releasing the seat back slowly to avoid making any unnecessary sound. As I accessed the trunk, I searched briefly, sliding my hand under and between the contents and was relieved to find one glorious bottle, the water still unfrozen, trapped under the stiff, insulating mass atop it. I pried it free without making too much noise, and I held it close as I returned to the front seat. It was the most beautiful bottle of water I'd ever seen in my life. I downed the water way faster than I'd meant to, my cracked lips and heavy tongue yearning for relief and it hit the bottom of my stomach like hot grease in a cold pan. I doubled over, my stomach cramping and threatening to empty itself in retaliation to the frigid invasion. I took slow, deep breaths as deep as I could until the cramps released me, but the air seemed to be getting thicker inside my car. 
my breath coming shallower by the minute. I looked to the air vents and could have sworn I saw a luminescent mist coming through. My eyes followed it as it danced peacefully in the front seat. I ran my fingers through it, giggling silently as it swirled around them. The multicolored pearlescent vapor swirled and mingled with my skin. Then a sudden paranoid thought occurred to me. This playful pearly mist might have been toxic. I yanked the collar of my shirt up over my nose in a panic, my giggles quickly giving away to terrified whispering sobs. God knows how much of it I'd already inhaled. At first, I'd wondered if it was maybe a lingering cloud of Jedi haze, but the color and texture were wrong. I closed my eyes, trying to remember any reference to glowing avalanche mist I might have read about, and when I opened them, the mist had disappeared. That's when I knew I was delirious. I was hallucinating. I hadn't eaten in more than a day. I barely had water. I was freezing, and I was breathing less oxygen than I needed. I had to get out of there. Then I remembered my book bag on the floor. I quietly pulled it up, careful to not let the fabric scrape too loudly, and started delicately rifling through it. What I needed had to be in there somewhere. I bought it specifically for this trip. Aha! My hand emerged with a solid mass of metal about the size and shape of a hockey puck. The grinder wouldn't be perfect, since smashing a window wasn't grinding flowers and stems into a smokable mix. But it would do. I didn't relish the cacophony of glass and snow it would create inside my car. But if I could just break the window, I might be able to burrow my way out through the snow. I figured it couldn't be that thick if I heard traffic through it. Winding back my arm as far as I could, I slammed the grinder into the window. The sound was blinding. It assaulted my ears just about as much as I had assaulted the window. It reverberated throughout my car and I wanted to cover my ears and hide. But my adrenaline was high, and if I stopped now, I might not get the chance or courage up to start again. I pounded at the glass. My hand ached from the impact, and I swore my ears would bleed from the sound. But I pushed through the pain and the terrible noise until there, just in the lower right corner, the smallest crack appeared. I concentrated on that crack for dear life until, eventually, the window shattered. Safety glass consumed my entire face and neck. I didn't care, though. Freedom was almost tangible. At that moment, I decided that once I'd made it out, I was moving somewhere without snow. Thoughts of tropical winters and warm sunsets fueled me as unwanted black lines writhed at the periphery of my vision. Everything felt like it was tilted sideways, and I thought I knew it had to be from the lack of oxygen. I swore the car was getting smaller with every increasingly shallow breath I took. I jammed my fist into the snow outside my window to scoop it out of the way and screamed as searing pain exploded in my hand. There was no snow outside my car, only a hardened wall of solid ice. Tears of hopelessness cascaded down my face as my hands flew randomly around the floorboards of the car further injuring my already battered fingers. Not that I could feel them anymore. There had to be something else I could use to protect my hands. That's when I spotted them. The socks I discarded earlier when my feet were on fire. They were covered in bits of glass or ice, but I didn't care. At that point, I... At that point, it didn't really make much difference. Both were freezing cold and razor sharp. For protection, I wrapped my hands in my socks and I resumed my attack on the ice with my grinder. Maybe the ice was thin, 
Maybe all I had to do was break away the first layer. And it would be the snow the rest of the way out. I hoped. But it wasn't that easy. I kept going anyway. I had to keep going. I had to get out. My arms were numb. My, my muscles weighed down from exertion. My head was fuzzy. And a suffocating heat began con to consume my body with every labored breath. Then... I felt a hint of fresh air hit my face, and I almost screamed with joy. The ice was stained a darkened red by then, and I couldn't bear to think of the state of my hands. I knew peeling back the socks to peek would only make me panic, which might use up the rest of my crucial oxygen. So I left them where they were. I wasn't done digging. I blindly hacked at the ice. My, my muscles renewed with, with hopeful vigor as each chunk of ice chipped away. I, I was caught up in, in a frenzy, blindly stabbing away at red ice and snow. I didn't stop until something hit the floor at my feet. My heart stopped as I leaned down to retrieve what had fallen. A shattered bloody finger with the bone protruding at the knuckle break. My biggest fear was the grinder had broken and I was left with nothing to dig my way out. The grinder was fine. But well, what was I supposed to do about my hands, though? After retrieving it, I knew my attempts at escape were fucked. Cold air kissed my cheek through the tiny air hole, leading to the outside world. <sighs> As darkness overwhelmed me, with freedom so close, <sighs> and yet so far, <sighs> I slipped into the void. A loud and persistent beeping pulled me back to an alarmed consciousness. When my eyes fluttered open again, my, my mind was still hazy and exhausted. My body didn't feel right, and the lights were killing me. As I got my bearings, I realized I wasn't in my car anymore. It looked like I was in the hospital, and my room was blindingly bright. My heart dropped a little when I saw I was alone. Though I don't know why I should have expected anything different, I was in a strange city, far from home with no one here that knew me. Still, despite being alone and hurt, I had to tell myself to just be happy, to be out of that damned car. Layers of skin ground against each other painfully in the back of my throat as I tried to swallow. I saw they were hydrating me intravenously, but was still so dry. I looked for the call button on the rail of my bed and I attempted to press it, only to see both of my hands heavily bandaged. A sickening dread of realization invaded my mind as the memories trickled back. I rammed the button with my elbow, and a young nurse came rushing in. She told me to hold on for a moment, and she'd grab the doctor to speak with me. Her voice was grating, but I nodded. An older doctor came in wearing a long white coat and a threadbare smile. He pulled up the stool next to my bed and sat down to explain. He said... A good Samaritan had seen my antenna poking up through the snow and called the police. They dug me out and found me unconscious, clutching a frozen finger in my hand. When they found their charger fit my phone, they plugged it in and called the top number in my contacts. My brother, Jason. He stuck around the first few days of my coma, but when the hospital said I'd probably need to be there for a while, he headed home. He couldn't afford the time off. 
The doctor said he drove my car back. It had taken quite the beating but was still in drivable condition. The Samaritan stopped by every couple of days to check on me. I couldn't wait to thank them. That simple act of kindness saved my life. The doctor said if I'd been there even a half hour longer, I wouldn't have made it. I tried leaving after a few weeks in the hospital. I still have things I need to do. But they keep denying my discharge. Honestly, I'm less bothered by it each time. I suppose my new home is the Chestnut Ridge Mental Facility. They say I have to stay. I may even begin to like it here. They kept the lights turned down and gave me a special set of earphones that block out sounds, but everything still seems so loud. My doctor told me to write all of this down as best I can with the remaining fingers I have. I lost three altogether, along with half my left foot. My body still feels cold all the time. I go into an inconsolable panic during snowstorms to the point where I need to be sedated. I haven't spoken a word since I woke up here. I can't handle the volume of my voice. I honestly wonder if I'm still able to speak at all, though I, I don't try. Even if I could, I'd never let them know why I was all the way out at Copper Mountain in the first place. Not that they're asking. No one has mentioned anything, or even tried to question me about the discarded body in the trunk, her dying skin still fresh from the cold. I'd like to keep it that way. Debbie had really been a dud, but I wasn't going to let her ruin my vacation. Old Man Winter by Jeffrey E. Bright Narrated by Jesse Cornett Featuring Jeff Clement, Brendan Hurlbert, and Todd Farrell Thank you for coming, Doctor. I honestly didn't think the renowned psychoanalyst Jeffrey Gilland would see me. Then again, it isn't every day you are handed the opportunity to interview an insane colleague. And I am your golden ticket to a more profound reputation. Aren't I? Please, you don't need that arched brow to impress me. I've spent years trading theory and thesis with you, Jeffrey. Until you published your paper on paranoid delusionals, I thought I was the only one making any progress in schizophrenic research. But I see my banter is falling under speculative regard. Very well. 
Let's begin with the reaffirmation of patient ID. My name is Professor Randall H. Courtney. I maintain doctorates in the fields of psychology, psychiatry, psychobiology, parapsychology, criminology, and religious mythology. The latter, a particular passion of mine. Until recent events, I was the head of Western University Psychology Department and special consultant to both Western Community Hospital and the state-funded Pleasant Glen Home for the Criminally Insane, specializing in sociopathic and schizophrenic cases. I am 57 years of age, moderately healthy, and unfortunately close to the precipice of insanity. Of course, you wouldn't be here if I were not. To the heart of the matter, as you would tell me when I began a long-winded diatribe, here, then, are the circumstances which led you here. It all began two weeks ago. I had read the case study of the holiday hacker, William James Morton, by Dr. Lansing in Athens. His paper discussed the complete personality and symptomatic juxtaposition of Morton. By all accounts, William James Morton was a classic case of a violent sociopath. He murdered a documented 156 women and children from 1993 to 2013. Undeniably, Morton was the most prolific serial killer ever substantiated in his claims. Unlike our tail-chasing study of Henry Lee Lucas, eh? As the typical profile of a serial murderer, Morton was a white male in his late thirties. Middle income class, with a social magnetism that allowed him to make friends easily. Coupled with an unusually high IQ, Morton was well liked by colleagues and friends who, of, of course, never suspected his nocturnal activities. Morton worked for the Indiana Public Utilities Commission as a meter reader. This gave him unlimited accessibility into his victims' homes, to which he would cleverly observe several potential targets for two to three weeks prior to making his move. All of Morton's victims were killed during holidays, most notably Christmas and Easter. As you know, Dr. Lansing asserts Morton killed on holidays because his parents did not celebrate any of the accepted Christian holidays, and that either the indifference or non-participation of social interactions with friends and family created Morton's behavior. Unfortunately, Lansing never appropriately explored the aspect of his ritual abuse by his father what the sexual recriminations his mother heaped upon him. And let us not forget his classic dissociation with morality and accepted social behavior. I see you have no taste for debate tonight. Very well. Morton ritualistically entered the household of families wherein the father worked a third or graveyard shift between the hours of 1 to 4 a.m. and proceeded to slit the throats of his victims from oldest to youngest. His signature was the destruction of a major holiday tradition, stripping a Christmas tree of ornaments, tearing up Easter baskets, shredding Valentine's Day cards, vandalizing the Thanksgiving centerpiece, etc. 
But you've already read Dr. Lansing's case study, eh, Jeffrey? Of course you have. You know, on the night of December 24th, 1993, the Jeffersonville police responded to a 911 call from a half-dead Iris Dennison. By the time they reported on scene, all three children, aged three to seven, were found dead in their bedrooms, as was Mrs. Dennison, still clutching the bedroom phone. Amongst the carnage and destruction, they found the five-foot, ten-inch meter reader balled up in the corner of the living room, covered in his own bodily fluids and the blood of his victims. The police report concluded with Morton's overwhelming confession and sorrow. What followed was to be the largest admission of serial murder ever told. As a matter of fact, when they found Morton's infamous tome of the season, the grisly journal of his slayings... Jesus Christ. Have you read this shit? I wager Morton told them where to find that damnable book. For some unknown reason, this brutal, remorseless killing machine was now raving like a paranoid schizophrenic in a highly manic, delusional state. Morton was now begging to be locked away for his crimes. This complete change portends an emotional 180 degree spin on all our known beliefs of mental illness. Curious? Don't you agree, Dr. Gilland? <clears throat> I see you're still not impressed. Very well. Let us move to the meat of the meal. The night of March 15th, the night Lansing and Morton died before my eyes. I must, however, warn you in good conscience, this tale will no doubt test the limits of your psyche. So I must ask you to suspend your disbelief until the tale is told. I cannot guarantee you will ever sleep soundly again, but... You will know the unbelievable truth which has stolen my sanity and placed me here under guarded supervision. Before that fateful day, I had thoroughly studied Morton's tome with avid interest. As a long-range researcher, Morton's Tome of the Season provided an invaluable resource, the likes of which had never been seen before, nor, I must suppose, will ever be seen again. Can you imagine a reference book for homicidal sociopaths written by a homicidal sociopath? This was no notebook of ranting against the machine of society, nor was it an incoherent catalogue of instability. With an above-average IQ, Morton meticulously entered all thoughts, actions, and variables of each murder, down to any minute smell, taste, and touch he experienced. His view was frighteningly clinical. Even his penmanship looked antiseptic, not obsessive. Words cannot express the terror of his analysis or the sheer horror of Morton's accurate observations on the death of his victims. Honestly, Morton's brilliance in notation and observation would shame the efforts of our most esteemed research colleagues. This was also the opinion expressed by Dr. Lansing. That is why he allowed me to study the tome as a precursor to our meeting. Morton, 
and I believe the sheer immensity of the task at hand brought me into the fray. Perhaps it was the simple fact that Lansing needed an intellectual equal to back up his claims and save his reputation from the assertions he was about to make. Whatever the case, I should have politely denied him and continued my life in the blessed ignorance which will never again be mine. Here, then, are the events of March 15th. Dr. Lansing and I arrived at Pleasant Glen just before 6 p.m. We were both in good spirits anxious about our first in-depth interview with the man the media had dubbed the Holiday Hacker. We had discussed the tome during the two-hour ride from the airport and had formulated a strategy for interrogation of William James Morton. However, the strategy disintegrated once we occupied the room with this killer. Morton was escorted into a room no bigger than the average living room, bound in a formidable straitjacket. His eyes were glassy, wide, darting, the epitome of a paranoid schizophrenic. He moved with shaky uncertainty and, if not for the armed guard, would have certainly fallen into the table instead of being seated at it. Lansing put on his psychiatrist hat and went to work. Good evening, William. My name is Dr. Lansing, and this is Dr. Courtney. We've come to ask you a few questions. Would you mind? To this, Morton giggled and spat. <laughs> Your dime. Fire away. We read your book, William. Lansing continued. Why did you write it? For posterity, head shrinker. It don't make no difference. Nothing does. <laughs> He began giggling like a schoolboy with a secret. What do you mean by that? I piped in. I feel sorry for you assholes, I really do. Morton said, rocking gently in his chair. I'm gonna pay for what I did, but you... You don't have a clue what's gonna happen. Maybe if you explained it to myself and Dr. Courtney, we might be able to... Save me? Morton cut in. <laughs> oh, I don't think so, Head Shrinker. Can't you smell the doom? Taste the fear? Is it because of all the people you've murdered? I asked. A sneer of righteousness crossed his lips. No. Not because of all the people I killed. Would you mind explaining what you mean? Said Dr. Lansing. You won't believe a word of it, but that don't matter. It's gonna happen whether you believe me or not, but I ain't saying nothing till you turn off those recorders. Agreed. We heeded his request and turned off our recorders. He simply smiled at the two of us, and his eyes seemed to clear and his demeanor altered. The armed guard behind Morton leaned against the wall as if holding it up, oblivious to the conversation. It was the last expedition I underwent, said Morton. The Denison family experiment. I am still sorry I did not have the time to record my observations. I found myself utterly without words as I listened to this madman speak without the previous trace of his drawl. His new verbal diction was measured, reflective, almost nonplussed. It was then an answer dawned on me for his abrupt and distinctive attitude alteration. 
The mystery of his 180 degree turn could be logically and anticlimactically explained. I jotted D I D into my notebook and sighed in profound disappointment to such an obvious solution which the psychiatric community used to call multiple personality disorder. So it was one of the denizens you regret killing? Asked Lansing, as if he didn't notice the change. Not for a moment. Morton's eyes sparkled. Apparently you forgot to read your paper on my aberrant behavior. <laughs> Lansing shuffled uncomfortably in his chair without response. I quickly jumped into the fray. What caused your radical behavioral change? Any idiot with half the imagination can fake paranoia, get more attention, and stricter supervision by his captors. His voice was almost clinical in its approach. A sociopath is simply locked into a cell, fed and watered as required by law, and forgotten. I cannot, will not, be casually erased from existence. So you're perpetrating this ruse for attention? Scowled Dr. Lansing. For witnesses. Why would you need witnesses? I interjected. Is Santa Claus coming to town? Morton sang in a sickly sweet child's voice. I don't understand, I said. I killed the jelly fed man. He said flatly. <laughs> what? Lansing and I gasped in chorus. I butchered Chris Kringle. Old man winner, Saint Nick, whatever you want to call it. What do you mean by it? I asked. Let me put it this way. Morton began. I could see his calm, controlled demeanor beginning to crumble like a glass house from a stone's throw. I have killed a lot of people. I know what that is. In all of my research, I have never seen anything like it. Oh, I might be a sociopath, but I am not insane. I know the direct effect of all my actions and am totally aware of every child and mother I put in the ground. But. I will not be stalked by a figment of ceremonial imagination. When it comes for me, I want others to tell the tale. I will not be dismissed as some raving lunatic and have my observations shelved as another madman's delusion. Enlighten us. Lansing asked with a certain smugness. Morton leaned forward on the table which caused the guard to lazily mutter. Watch yourself, Morton. I'm only a step away from busting your ass. Oh, I'm sure you are. Morton dismissed the man. It was Christmas Eve, and I had just finished my experimentation on the children. By the way, did you know you can open a child's jugular vein when they're sleeping and they will continue sleeping into death, cradled in the warmth of their pooling blood? That is, unless you make noise or your instrument is not sharp enough. Interesting. Lansing said clearly, uninterested. Thank you, Doctor. Morton's voice was less than gracious. I believe that was the moment he began to lose interest in Lansing's presence and spoke directly to me. As I was saying, I had just completed my study and was busy leaving my calling card. Defacing the Christmas decorations? I supplied. Yes. He nodded to me. It was during my ceremonial defacing of the tree when I heard a large thump. Like a pot roast hitting the counter from thirty feet. Pot roast? Yes, kind of, kind of a meaty plop. He looked directly in my eyes. I could tell the story was an attempt to reaffirm his tentative grip on what he considered reality. 
I turned around expecting to find one of my victims in the survival category of willpower over wounding. It's only 10% do, you know. Interesting theory. Lansing offered, trying to reestablish his role in the conversation. Could you offer more on this aspect? No. Morton dismissed Lansing and continued. I turned around to find a fat man in a red and white suit. Yes, he was, he was covered in ashes and suit. Yes, he had a big round belly shaking like a bowl full of jelly. All the stereotypes were accurate. Santa Claus? The name escaped my mouth in reserve disbelief. In all his wonder... Morton's eyes began shifting to the barred window and back to me. <laughs> the fat abomination started to laugh like life was all hearts and flowers. And all the holidays I never had were in the past and meant to be forgotten. He had the audacity to glorify a celebration that the Christians stole from the pagans and capitalists stole from God himself. So I planted my scalpel in his chubby throat. <laughs> what? My shock could not be contained. I knifed him. He said with a cool, triumphant smile. And he had the nerve to spit out through the blood. <laughs> <laughs> You're being naughty. He pulled the scalpel out and picked me up off his feet and said, Santa doesn't like naughty little boys and girls. That tub of lard tossed me across the room like a rag doll. I remained silent. I had nothing to say to this unbelievable tale. You probably guessed that irritated me. He tried to shrug off the rest of the story, but it flowed from his lips like bitter wine. The first thing that came to hand was the Christmas tree stand, which lay discarded among the remnants of light strands and broken bulbs. I used the stand to split its head open like an overripe melon. By the time I was finished, its head was a bloody bowl of red oatmeal. But it tried to get up. Can you imagine my surprise and frustration? No, I can't. I responded. Well, this was no experience a clinical man like myself was prepared to anticipate. I improvised, knocked it to the floor. Severed its head from its body and got myself together to leave. Unfortunately, Santa had wasted valuable escape time. I was trapped. My mind tried to figure out what to do next. That's when I heard a bloody gurgle behind me. Santa was on his feet, wagging a finger at me. He stopped for a moment to regain his composure. And do you know... What that bloated corpse said. What? Droned Lansing. I'll be back, you bad little boy. And then popped up the chimney and jingled off into the night. And this is your explanation for your abrupt change in behavior? Lansing scoffed. I can smell fish stories from miles away. Do you truly think I will report this hogwash? I don't care what you do, you academic leech. Morton growled. Why didn't the police see Santa fleeing the scene? Wouldn't they have been tipped off by Rudolph's nose lighting the way? Lansing taunted. Morton turned to me, his eyes intense and focused. I just needed a fellow colleague to listen and to know. I am surprised I have not been assassinated by now. I have spent too many nights wondering when my end will come. Now it doesn't matter if it comes for me. The story has been told. 
That is all. Indeed, sniffed Lansing. I've never heard such... Lansing trailed off, cocking his head like a collie to a dog whistle. Do you hear bells? At this point, Jeffrey... Reality crumbled. It was almost as if the terror was waiting for its cue to take the stage. The sweet sound of bells grew louder and louder as a red light from outside the window drew closer. Oh shit, it found me! It seemed Morton's persona switched again and struggled within his bonds. Let me out of this jacket, goddammit! The wall of the interview room exploded noiselessly into the dark night, collapsing as if it were hit with a great silent force from inside the room. The dust swirled about the gaping maw as three of the four of us stood frozen in place. It found me! Morton shrieked as he pushed off his chair and tried to make himself small behind the interview table. The guard broke from deep lethargy and pulled his gun. Freeze, you son of a bitch! He pointed the shaking weapon toward the hole in the wall. From a sleek, red, levitating sleigh, two smallish men, roughly three feet tall, with pointed shoes and ears to match, grinned maniacally and quickly disembarked. The obscene jingling of their droopy conical hats mocked the viciousness of their body language. They stood like doormen at the sides of the missing wall, leering wildly at the bewildered foursome. Which one? Called one of the little men in a shrill soprano. We all held fast in pure terror as it stepped through the hole. It wore the suit of Santa and bounded from the sleigh with a jolly stride. All the myths were true except for Santa's head. It was more an assembly of leftover parts from a slaughterhouse than a head with a pristine red hat. It looked like roadkill which had boiled on the unforgiving black asphalt for days. Jagged bone protruded from shredded pulpy muscle as the dark stained beard revealed a ruptured orifice which could only be the mouth. It rasped in a voice of sandpaper and pain which pierced my very soul. Daddy. It pointed a gloved finger at the hiding serial killer. The men in green, elves, I would presume, advanced on Morton, glaring. Am I invisible? The guard barked, drawing back the hammer on his forty caliper pistol. Now back the fuck up! I won't say it again! Faster than the mind could comprehend, one of the elves was upon him. Eyes wide with disbelief, the guard watched as the little man tore into his flesh like a rabid wolverine. The guard... I believe Carl was his name, found himself caught in the middle of an eruption of blood. His blood. Carl had the horrifying honor of watching himself being autopsied while still alive. His last memory was of his entrails sliding from his chest cavity and slapping the floor. He quickly collapsed to the gray-flecked institutional tile, cocked gun still in hand. Finally, 
Lansing reacted. He vomited, spewing God's name between each hasty exit of the day's meal. The two elves pounced on Morton, hauling him to his feet amidst his tearful protests. <laughs> no, please, no. The elves clamped around his bound arms like a metal vice grip. This only increased Morton's shrinking. And what, you may ask, was I doing during all this? Nothing. No, that is not true. I was trying to escape to the part of the mind we psychologists claim comatose patients go when severely traumatized by life. My little place must have been closed for repairs, for I was forced to witness the hideous events that continued before my previously agnostic eyes. Morton continued sobbing and rocked in his straitjacket. Lansing continued vomiting and taking the Lord's name in vain, and I became a statue as the corrupted thing in the red suit advanced upon his elf book ended victim. The thing's head contorted in an expression which most likely was a smile amongst the shredded muscles of its face. It lifted Morton's tear-stained face with a gloved finger, as if examining a slave, soon to be auctioned. No, please, no, I'll be a good boy. Morton pleaded to mutilated ears. The elves giggled <laughs> knowingly. As if it were not surrealistic enough, Lansing came under control and tried asserting himself as the voice of reason. Can you imagine, Jeffrey? The old fool tried to rationalize with mythical characters in our unfathomable situation. I could smell death upon him even before he managed to spew his initial salvo of psychobabble. The elves released the whimpering Morton and focused on Dr. Lansing. Their movements would have shamed the best bodyguard or secret service agent as they swarmed Lansing. This situation has not become unsalvageable. Perhaps we can avoid any further unpleasantness if we can allow ourselves a moment of reflection. One of the elves came face to face with Lansing, listening to his words with a contemplative face. The first elf nodded agreeably, and said in that squeaky soprano, Mm-hmm. No! With a stealth of shadow, the second elf neatly penetrated Lansing's back with a petite, clawed hand. The intrusion must have granted Lansing a form of anesthetic shock, for his face was less comprised of pain than surprise. Whatever the case, Lansing fell to his knees immediately as I watched the demonic second elf play in tug of war with Lansing's spinal column, while the first elf continued to lock his gaze onto Lansing as if mimicking the suffering from the psychologist's eyes. And the tug of war was being lost until the second elf put a foot on the doctor's back and wrapped its fist around the exposed section of his spine. <coughs> Effort redoubled. Lansing's spine popped loudly, then slid from his body with a wet sucking sound. The little monsters briefly considered Lansing's wide-eyed death mask, cackled gleefully, and went back to their original target, ignoring my useless presence. Maybe it was the dismissal of me as harmless entity that awakened me. Vanity has always been a great motivator in our profession. It was as if the magical inner button had been switched off for my senses returned. 
I was wrapped in raging anger for the first time in my life, and it was my assertion that these abominations of nature needed to be brought to justice. At least, I prefer to think my motives were purely altruistic instead of triggered through selfish preservation. My first thought was of my need for a weapon. I then remembered the guard's unfired gun. I mustered my courage and walked slowly toward Carl's mutilated body in my only salvation. They continued to ignore me, preferring to get no, please, the no. pleading Morton under control. I retrieved the heavy weapon without incident. Until that day, the thought of firing a weapon repulsed me. Yet I was beyond the point of moral justification. My clinical world was at an end, and I was determined to survive the brave new world into which I had been so unceremoniously thrust. The unreality that was the three interlopers blanketed the sobbing Morton. Naughty, repeated the aberrant Santa as his mitten-clothed hands reached for the pristine red hat on its mutilated head. Naughty, I quietly mumbled. Actually, I believe I giggled it as I said it. It was that giggle that alerted the elves. Both of the little green monsters spun on their heels and faced me like a western showdown. I did not mix hyperbole. I simply pulled the trigger. The gun roared, catching one of the elves in its slender neck. In fact, the forty caliber bullet nearly severed the elf's head. It sputtered some ancient gibberish and fell to the ground, twitching. Unfortunately, the remaining elf was quickly upon me, rather, upon my leg. It lashed out with its savage claws, removing my patella with near-surgical precision as if it were an old-fashioned bottle cap. Pain exploded across my being, yet this was not the time to recognize my shortcomings. I fell backwards and struck the unforgiving institution floor. I scarcely had the opportunity to blink before the little creature was upon my chest set to strike the killing blow. It shrieked, raising a gore-soaked talon. <laughs> yes, I smiled. I almost experienced a moment of pity for the little elf as it felt the gun barrel dig into its crotch. Almost. At close range, the bullet shredded through the elf. throwing its live body across the room. Believe me when I say this, Geoffrey. If I were you, I would be wearing the same disbelieving expression. Sometimes in the silence of night, I myself have cause to doubt all that occurred in this antiseptic room at Pleasant Glen. Yet I cannot escape the conclusion in the immortal words of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Here, then, is the most improbable fate of William James Morton. I struggled to my feet, the table a proper crutch to my shattered leg. Though it seemed like an eternity, I had dispatched Santa's helpers in a matter of seconds. I unfortunately did not miss the horror unfolding between Morton and the shredded Santa. Excluding the appearance of its head, 
the scene played out innocently. The obese dead thing removed the hat. To this, the straight-jacketed Morton bellowed and squirmed like a worm on a hook. Santa calmly placed the hat upon Morton's head and chuckled. Ho, ho, ho! Never had I heard a cry of such torment and terror as I heard that day, nor do I ever wish to hear it again. My blood ran cold as the holiday hacker, bound and helpless, called to a god he never believed in while the aberrant creature offered a grotesque, gurgling chuckle. I raised my weapon, not knowing what I could do against his terrified screams. Kill me! Morton's eyes locked to mine. Kill me before it's too late! I leveled the gun at his head. The corpse Santa made no motion to stop me. Please, please, please! Morton cried. I can feel it! Hurry! I swallowed hard and squeezed the trigger. <laughs> to this day, I do not know if I was too late or if the bullet would have had any effect had I delivered it sooner. Needless to say, I placed a bullet hole neatly in the middle of Morton's forehead. The bullet hole puckered, diminished, and sealed the flesh of his forehead as the manic terror in Morton's eyes swelled. The metamorphosis had begun. Before my eyes, the smallish frame of William James Morton expanded, along with growing girth. His facial features softened, losing the terrified sociopath and puffy cheeks. His face erupted in white tufts of hair, with the hair upon his head lengthening in a shocking snowy white. His restraints melted into a thick red blouse with matching pants as bare feet became shod in shiny black boots. During this transformation, the thing that was Santa deflated like a balloon slowly, losing air. When it hit the cold floor, Morton rose to his feet. No, it was no longer William James Morton. Ho, ho, ho! It roared, jelly belly and all. As if on cue to this battle cry, the dead elves exploded. showering the room in large cottony flakes. It was at this point my mind decided it had truly seen enough. I fell to the floor and began laughing as I tried to catch a snowflake or two upon my proffered tongue. I wondered to myself how many I could catch before I bled to death. The new Santa looked at me for a moment and patted me on the head. Now you be a good little boy, he offered with a wink, thumbed his nose, and through the blasted portal he rose. Once through the hole in the wall, the crumbled bricks reformed and jumped back into place, resealing the room as if the intrusion never happened. My memories pick up in the hospital as an attending doctor told me I would most likely never walk again. I remember my comment being slightly sarcastic, but I cannot remember what I said.
It really does not matter at this point. So, Jeffrey, am I insane? Oh, don't look at me that way. I know. Only an insane person could create such a fantastic world to play a scenario such as this. If only the evidence did not exist to the contrary, eh? The psychiatric community will play it off as an extreme psychotic episode from a man who has worked too closely to his subjects. The local law enforcement unwilling to advertise multiple grisly homicides will be more than happy to agree and quietly close the case. However, before I am escorted back to my padded room, consider this. We as a society look to insane explanations to rationalize those topics which we personally do not wish to breach. Babies coming from a benevolent stork, weather balloons cross the globe as UFOs, the Son of God relieves the weight of personal sin by ritualistic torture and eventual death. In this pantheon, my greatest fear is reserved for a creature that keeps track of our morals, rewarding or punishing us for being nice or naughty. A beast which preys only upon the most innocent of our culture. Children. A being which despite the security alarms and fences is allowed to enter our house and is given unrestricted access to our inner sanctum. We do not question his valor or mission. We simply expect this modern icon to perform in a righteous manner. But I must ask, what if this creature is not here for our mythical amusement? What if, like the old wives' tales of cats who steal children's sleeping breath, old Saint Nick has an ulterior, sinister motive? You know, Jeffrey, the suicide rate for Christmas is staggeringly higher than any other time of the year. Coincidence. Have we, in fact, unleashed a terror into our normal lives that sustains itself with supernatural malfeasance? Now, more than ever, I remain skeptical. No matter. I believe I shall never leave this place. I have seen too much, and perhaps said too much. My advice to you, dear Jeffrey, you better watch out. You'd better not cry. You'd better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town.
blood froze from dark red to moonlight blue under the slap of Gore's bare feet. Each step took more skin off of the blackening soles and froze it to the sharp granite of the craggy trail. A week ago, he would have run in the snow, but the hard freeze made the glittering crust like thin glass. Moreover, rocks don't leave deep footprints, just bloody ones. Gore hoped that whatever was chasing him couldn't track by the smell of blood. It had only been five minutes, maybe less, since he'd last heard its massive feet plodding along behind him. And most arctic predators could scent a hair under six feet of snow. Gore ran faster. He was becoming too numb to feel the rocks beneath him. Soon he'd have to put his boots back on or he'd start losing toes. Besides, the sure-footedness of being barefoot no longer applied once you couldn't feel the ground. The last thing he could afford was to slip, break a leg, and lay helpless for that thing. He crossed into the shadows of the pine forest. The moon didn't shine through the limbs, and even the white of the snow had disappeared from his pulsing vision. Feeling his way in the dark, he bounced off of something like a tree trunk and steadied himself. The tree was devoid of bark and had jagged edges carved into it. Gore sighed with relief. He leaned against the pole and began trying to navigate his frostbitten feet back into his leather boots. He would definitely lose some toes, but it was better than losing his head. As his eyes adjusted and his strength returned, he suddenly saw the grim, scowling face of a blocky creature hovering next to his. Chills that had nothing to do with the harsh winter shivered down his arms and spine. The face resolved further, lips bright red, eyes stark white. He looked away, despite this being the very thing he'd been seeking, like it could see into him and knew who he was. This pole with the carven faces was part of a forest all its own, rimming the edge of the northern slope of the granite butte. Dozens of images, evil faces on top of comical ones, mixed with animals and spirits, were all hewn into the trunks of sacred trees and placed as a barrier between the Clinket village and the granite butte. The tribal totems were said to protect the natives against the demons of the north. Gore hoped that was true, but not too true. He huddled in the fur coat he'd found on the headless corpse and counted to 100. Nothing moved but wraith-like wisps of snow in the icy breeze. The thing had lost his trail. He lit a match and the wooden faces sprang to life. With an uneasy hand, he patted one on the cheek. You watch out for me now, Crow. You protect me, you hear? The face didn't reply. As Gore walked away, he thought, What kind of monsters do you protect against, you bastard? Hopefully not all of them. A bare spot against a frozen creek bed provided enough shelter for Gore to start a small fire without fear of being seen by the hairy thing. Tomorrow he would go into the Clinket village and ask for safekeeping. The Clinket didn't much like the tribe. They sent something about the small cadre of white men that they didn't trust, but they were his only chance. They knew him in the village, had actually liked him once. Maybe that would mean something. Morning came with a cold wind. 
Gore hadn't slept much, but at some point he shut down his mind enough to forget about the tribe and that boy and that thing that he'd found in the cave, or rather that had found him in the cave. When he came to, the sun was just gleaming over the horizon. He'd only have an hour of daylight before it disappeared again, so he went toward the village. Snow had obscured everything so completely that he almost walked by the first lodge without realizing that it was even there. His hopes sank. There was no one inside. The village, which should have been rich with smoke and activity, was completely abandoned. Silent. He looked around, but there was only stillness punctuated by long shadows creeping into the woods. Why would they leave? The Clinket rarely moved camp once they settled in for the winter, and this was an abnormally cold year. Before organizing the tribe with McTerry, Gore had spent several weeks in this village trading the sugar and tobacco with the natives. It was where he learned how to hide his tracks by running barefoot along ridgelines, how to dress all kinds of animals for food, and most importantly, where he learned to imitate the behavior of the Clinket people a skill he'd thought useless until he met McTerry. Then, one day, he and the Scotsman shared a bottle of whiskey in Dawson and came up with the idea for the tribe. Soon they were jumping claims together using Gore's knowledge to make it look like clinket raiding parties. Business was so good that the tribe expanded to almost a dozen men before the winter got cold and things got bad. Then that boy and his sugar came along and made it all worse. The whole thing started and ended with sugar. Even in the boom towns, a man could be hung or shot over sugar, no questions asked and the tribe wasn't nearly that civilized. Gore found the fire pit in the center of the village. It was a small depression in the snow, far smaller than he'd ever thought useful in the Arctic cold. The clinket used surprisingly little fire, he remembered. He went past the pit to the elder's lodge, the lodges to either side were only sticks protruding out of the snow. The hides that had once been stretched over them had been removed, too valuable to leave. The elder's lodge was still intact though, and hopefully that meant there was food inside. The flap was crusted shut so that Gore had to cut around the lashings with his knife and pull off the whole hide like it was a solid wooden door. He threw it aside and lowered his mining lantern into the dark opening. The sun was already beginning to dim. As the lantern crossed the threshold, a face appeared in the center of the lodge. Gore jumped back, thinking that the thing from the cave had somehow followed him to the village. Knife still in hand, he stumbled backwards to a crouch and prepared to defend himself. Darkness fell over the lodge door, but the face did not emerge, nor did the beast come lunging out to devour him like it had McTerry and the tribe. All was silent. Gore went back to the lodge, this time focusing the light into the shadow slowly. The form of a man resolved itself in the darkness. The man was seated in a prayer position, one he'd seen many times during his stay in the village. The man didn't move. The frosted black face had been dead for a long time. 
Gore dragged the frozen body out into the dying sun. He was shirtless, painted for battle, a lone warrior left to keep vigil. But against what? There was something familiar about the red markings on the warrior. He wasn't the elder, nor anyone that Gore could remember, but he'd seen those markings somewhere before. He cleaned off the frost from the clinket's bare chest, and a symbol appeared. It was a familial symbol, belonging to an important tribal matriarch. The symbol was drawn with a finger into a deep, blood-red stain that had been painted onto the warrior's chest. Gore suddenly remembered where he'd seen it. It was the same symbol that the boy had painted on his face. The boy with the sugar. Ten minutes later, Gore had the fire pit dug out and had built as big a fire as he could find wood for. The frozen arm of the warrior, chipped off with his hatchet, was roasting above the flame on a pile of rocks. Gore's mouth watered with the smell of cooked meat, and he smiled at the irony. Like father, like son. McTerry was probably the only other literate member of the tribe, so Gore knew that the journal must have been his, meaning that it must have been McTerry's headless body that he'd found hanging from the tree and McTerry's coat he was wearing now. His name wasn't on the journal, but that made sense. No one wanted to be associated with any record of the tribe's actions. With a full stomach, Gore began reading the words by the glow of the dying fire. He feared that the huge, hairy beast was out there somewhere, just beyond the protective ward of the totems, and the journal was the only key to what had happened at the cave the only chance he had to survive. It began. November 22. It's already under deep freeze. Oh, this winter will be a hard one. Can't return to Dawson. Most of the soldiers gotten off to fight the Spaniards. Thought this would be a good thing, but the Mounties are worse, much more savvy. They don't fall for Gordon's ruse. They say these savages wouldn't take the miner's scalps. Gordon said no one would know the difference because most of the soldiers had been engine hunters after the civil and expected scalpins. Mounties don't fall for it though, and now they're looking real hard at us. Can't go to Dawson, even with the season's gold just waiting in our pockets. Damned fool, Gordon. Provisions are low, but we'll hit the miners' cabin soon enough. Time to get on the war paint. Gore skipped ahead. He knew this part. About how the miners had been smart enough to leave their claims before the freeze that year, and how they took everything with them. They'd only found one old hermit braving out the winter, and he'd only had a rack of fish and very little meat on his bones. After that, two of the tribe had made a run for it and tried their luck in Dawson. From what Gore knew, one of them had made the slip on an outgoing steamer, but the other was recognized and hanged before he got his first drink. Everyone else was too scared to leave and had holed up in a cave that they used to store their booty. All pickaxes and mercury bottles, but no food. Still, they thought it would be safe to winter in that cave. Even the clinket didn't go up that mountain. December 3. Well, Gordy has redeemed himself some. Brought back an engine boy coming from Dawson. Had a half sack of sugar. Not much, but an easy split. 
Moreover, the boy is still summer fat enough to make a decent meal. We let Gordon do his bit. Seems to bother him little enough. We call him Gore for a reason, I suppose. There was an awful amount of fat in that boy. Cave smells like grease fire, but ain't no one here praying for gourmet eats. God knows how these engines stay so fat, oh, but God bless them. They do for a fine meal in a pinch. Gore thought back to the boy and removed a leather pouch of brown crystals from his pocket. Like a Chinaman stingy on snuff, he tucked a little sugar under his tongue and let it melt away the flavor of the frost-burned warrior. He hefted the leather pouch and lamented how light it had grown. When they'd taken it from the boy, it had a full two pounds. Then he noticed for the first time that the colored thread pattern on the side made the same familial symbol as was painted on the warrior's chest. Huh, <sighs> guess I was right. He began to muse, but was suddenly distracted by a sound from the darkness of the woods. It was faint at first, but soon Gore could swear that he heard a small child moaning. It grew louder. It was a boy. The boy. The sound became a groan and a huff. Kind of a low, repeating wail, but without the wind behind it to be considered a cry. He'd heard it many times when a mine collapsed on a man's chest, or when he'd shot a blue coat in the lung during the war. This one he knew intimately. It was the sound of the boy when he'd bled him out, cut his throat. They'd saved the blood, but no one could bring themselves to drink it, so it just spoiled. Now he heard it plainly belching out of a split neck somewhere in the darkness beyond the totems. He felt the tingle of fear creeping up his spine, but pushed it down and told himself he was just shaken from cold and scurvy. The sound faded. Gore retreated to the elder's lodge with his knife and hatchet both brandished. That thing was out there. It was trying to draw him out, maybe drive him crazy. Is that how it got the tribe? He ate more sugar and tried to sleep. The totems would protect him. An hour later, he was shocked awake by another noise from the darkness. This time it came from the opposite direction, where he knew that the totem border was closest to the village. This time it was a different sound. Similar but more bestial, more savage, like cutting the throat of a bear or dying elk. It was louder. That thing may have only been 200 yards away, just pacing the border and taunting him with its devil voice. He pulled the frozen hide back into place over the lodge door, knowing that the flimsy walls would do little to keep out the cold or the demons that haunted it. The sound faded away so slowly that it was painful to hear. Then silence came, deep and sleepless. Gore lit a lantern. December 15. Engines are tramping about round the base of the butte, making a hell of a racket. Started yesterday. They was calling out a name. The boy's name, most like. Then they stopped for a while. Buff went to check it out. Came back with a scare in him. Said they was by the totems with a bigger fire than he'd ever seen him use. The old one was sitting prayer-like 
and the others was dancing. Now ain't none of that surprising. These savages get up to all kinds of hoodoo. One gets used to it. But what had Buff in a huff? <laughs> Buff in a huff. <laughs> oh, is that he says they was communicating with the dead. God knows how he got that idea. Says he'd seen him talking to the smoke and that the smoke was talking back in the voice of that boy. Said he couldn't understand that gibberish. But he swore that one of the braves looked up the butte towards our cave with a real angry look. Then they all howled. Howled like devils at the moon. Whatever that voice in the smoke told him sure put a fire in him. Coward Buff ran back lickety-split, piddling all over himself. I say the lack of food has got us all a little loopy. Maybe we'll make a foray into the village soon. Get some more grub. A fat squaw would do just right. <laughs> a bestial growl rent the silence. It was the sound that the thing had made when it lunged out of the cave at Gore. This time it was accompanied by a violent knocking on dried wood that was somehow more chilling than the moan but only just. A few seconds later, a cracking sound like old timber falling in the wind came echoing through the darkness. The thing huffed once more in violent triumph and fell silent again. Gore turned the page with panicked fingers. December 17. Oh, Gordy's done it this time. We just held counsel and found him guilty of theft. We only had one pound of sugar left. Then suddenly we only had a half. Use three of these miners' gold scales we got lying around to confirm it. Pack inspection found half a goddamn stolen pound of sugar in Gordy's stash. <laughs> says he's innocent, that it was a frame-up. Oh, doesn't matter. Rules are clear. Some of the boys say that we should go easy since Gordy helped found the tribe and says we should just kick him out of the cave. Others say that's dangerous because he could come back at any moment. Gordy says it's a fate worse than death. Frankly, I don't care, so long as there's one less mouth to feed. He's standing out of the cave and bellowing that he's innocent. <laughs> That's a good laugh. Ain't none of us innocent of anything. In other news, the Injuns are back at their hoodoo down below the rise there. I think that's part of what's got Gore too stirred up to count his blessings and leave with his life. Sounds like they got a caged bear down there growling away. Don't know what they plan on doing with it, but ten barrels of scatter shot and a hungry belly says I hope they send it this way. Gore had stolen the sugar. He told himself that no one would notice, but that was just the hunger talking. Everyone knew exactly how much sugar they had left. He also remembered the growling, and it had indeed given him the shivers. When he'd finally given up pleading and left the cave, the noise had faded into the background, and he remembered breathing a sigh of relief. He never did see what was making it. He'd spent the next couple of days trying to make it back to Dawson, but when the snow came in thick, he knew he'd never make the pass. So he decided to turn around and try to make peace with the tribe. He'd eaten most of his coat, boiled it in snow melt, and swallowed it fur and all. His teeth were beginning to hurt, and he knew what came next if he didn't find fresh food. But fresh food would be a long ways off. 
When he got back to the butte, he was startled to find that the trail up to the cave was red with frozen blood. It disappeared into the woods at the bottom of the butte. Despite his curiosity, Gore waited until the sun came up and devoted its precious short hour of warmth to follow in the trail. It abruptly disappeared right before the line of totems. He found there a decapitated corpse spitted on the branch of a tree. He took its coat, grimy and smelling of decay. Its pockets held only a journal and the leather pouch of remaining sugar. Then he went up the butte cautiously, slowly rounding on the cave. He didn't know it at that time, but he would soon be running for his life from the thing hiding there. The low, strangled moan of a dying man came from deep in the forest. Gore startled from his reminiscence. The sound droned on, intermittently interrupted by a choking sound, as if the gout of arterial blood were getting backed up in the dying man's throat. Gore froze, moving only his eyes to make sure that the knife and hatchet were still in his numb fingers. Why hadn't he taken a gun from the cave when he had the chance? The sound faded, and silence so profound that it was deafening fell over the darkness again. Gore edged forward, stiff legs protesting. From a gap in the frozen hide, he could barely just see out into the moonlight. At first, it was all just snow and the silhouettes of ancient trees but his eyes searched around until they fell onto the corpse of the dead warrior that he'd stepped over to get to the lodge. Never step over a dead body. He heard McTerry's voice echo in his mind. Superstitious, Gore had thought, just like all his kind. But now he wasn't so sure. Hadn't the corpse been facing the other way? And what was that glint in its eyes? The moonlight? But hadn't its eyes been shut? The sound of a man bleeding out through his own cut throat ripped across the silence again. Gore could have sworn that it was coming from the corpse but his mind was so frayed that he couldn't be sure. He pulled back into the lodge with a stifled yelp, and the sound stopped. More knocking sounds came from the woods, like someone angrily pounding on the totems out in the distance. Another crack of dried wood and a triumphant growl. What can stop it? He thought desperately. Something has to be able to stop it. He turned up the lamp and flipped the page. December 18. God damn, what a night. What a goddamn night. All night through those damn savages chanting away. That thing they got down there is growling up a storm. Buff went back down there an hour ago. Oh, he'd given him up for a goner, but he came back all a twitter again. Said that thing they got tied up down there ain't natural. Said that only one brave is left there, some shirtless crazy fuck. Buff's gotta be delirious. Said he's the only one chanting. But there's the voices of at least a dozen men down there. Must be hiding in the woods. Of course, good chance we're all a little delirious. I'm gonna go have a look myself. I want to get a gander at this thing that Buff's all worked up over. Says it's completely hairy, like an ape from the circus, but that it stands on two legs like a man. 
I have never seen a circus, so I can't say. Said it's only a few feet tall, three or four, and it's chained to a totem. That's nuts, because Injuns don't use chains. Says it stinks, too. That I believe, because I can damn near smell it all the way up here. Like old garbage in a July latrine. The way it bellows is just... Well, let's just say it's about time to put an end to it. December 18, night. Well, I got some good news. We got full bellies. That is, if we can manage to keep it down. We ate that hairy thing. First I got La Bouffe, and we snuck down there real quiet-like. Got within seeing range of that crazy engine. And boy, do I mean crazy. You ain't got no idea. Feller had that big old fire going, and sure enough, that thing was chained up down there, going a mile a minute. Like it was rabid or something, just like Buff says. I don't know how he saw us. We were real sneaky. Damn sure we hadn't made a noise. We've gotten good at sneaking in the tribe. We knows what we're doing. But some way that brave knew just where to find us. He stopped his chanting, all dozen voices of it, and looked up right at Le Buff and me hiding in the crags. I hefted my rifle to put an end to it, but before I could fire, that damned engine pulled up a bowie and clean cut his own damned throat with a deep, slow cut. Oh my god, that ting on the chain went berserk. Like it knew what was coming next. You see, that brave looked away from us right before he did it. Looked right at that monkey ting and they both got real quiet. The ting got all still like it was afraid. Then the brave nodded to it like they understood each other. Well, the next thing we know, gouts of blood are all gushing onto the snow. The brave fell down, shaking like he had the palsy, and the thing went to screaming and jerking at its chains with the power of ten men. Damned lucky it was chained and not just tethered. So, the next thing I know, I hear a loud crack next to me, and Le Buff had put a fifty ball right in that thing's head. Damned fine shot when he needs to be. So we go down the hill and Le Buff is all talking about how he's gonna eat the monkey thing. Like he didn't even see the blamed crazy engine just bleed himself out like that. To be honest, my mouth would have been watering too if it hadn't been for the stench. Oh my god, the stench. It's all about the cave now. But I guess it's better to be stinking than starving. Next, we start dressing the ting, mostly to get its head free from the chain, and the fire starts to burn down. But it's not quite out yet when that engine elder overguesses his gunning, and I see him moving between a couple of trees in the shadows. I turn and fire, oh, but go wide, and Le Buff gets up his gun. He pulls and it clicks on an empty chamber. Damned fool was so excited for meat that he didn't reload. Anyway, I look back and that crazy brave is gone. His body had clearly been dragged by some other engine into the woods. I thought about going after them right then, but knew they'd have sport of us if we went into the woods. I'm not worried about the cave. We got half ton of mining charges and more pistols and rifles than we could shoot in a week. They know they're no good coming up our way, which is why I figure they'd try and draw us into the pine. Anyway, Le Buff and I get the meat back here and the boys damn near kiss us despite the smell. It was greasy, and I swear to God that the stink is coming out of our pores. But like I say when the boys complain, ain't none of us gourmet.
Gore looked out of the gap in the lodge again. He hadn't noticed before, but it did indeed look like that corpse had its throat cut. The red of the blood glistened as though it were still wet. A black shadow dashed across the scene between Gore and the corpse. A strong smell of decay and garbage struck him through the gap like a bad wind. The smell was familiar. It was the smell of the thing that had been chasing him the previous night. It was also the smell that was so strong in the cave and on his new coat. What was it the journal had said? That stink is coming out of our pores. Gore sniffed the coat and winced. The shadow darted by again. This time, the sound of the clinket boy bleeding out came loudly from just behind the lodge. Only the thin layer of hide and frost to separate them. It was deafening. Gore huddled in the middle of the flimsy structure, scared. He'd not known fear for a long time. Not when he was in the war, not when he'd come north with nothing but a pistol and whatever gear he could rustle from the rushers. Not when the Mounties came after him for scalping miners. But now he was scared. He looked down at the journal. There were only blank pages left. What had happened at the cave? It couldn't have been that small beast they'd eaten. They said it had only been three or four feet tall. The one in the darkness was huge. Maybe an older one. A parent? An angry parent looking for its child? Shit! The smell came back as the lodge jolted, struck by a very large fist. I'm not worried about the cave, the journal had said. They know they're no good coming up our way. But maybe something else would have better luck, Gore thought. Then the brave nodded to it like they understood each other. Not a lone warrior standing vigil, Gore realized of the corpse, but a sacrifice, a bargain, a life for a life, and now the thing knows how to find the ones it sought. The only language that makes sense to demon beasts, the scent, the scent of sin, on the hunt. Revenge. He raised his hatchet defensively toward the door, impotent fear coursing through him. The lodge shook again. Frost fell around Gore like a dusting of snow. The sound of a child dying echoed through the darkness again. But not a human child this time. A bestial one, pierced through the skull by a lead ball. Then a long, slow moan of mourning that ended in a violent, angry howl. An anger so determined that it overcame nine armed men, so keen that it destroyed the guardian totems, so final that it cost the people of the village whatever uneasy peace they held with the demons of the north. It howled again, and the sound of the frozen warrior's corpse shattered by its great strength tinkled like broken glass through the walls. Gore shook. The tent shook. 
And then the world exploded into a moonlight snowscape as the hide walls were rent apart. Gore screamed. Jim Sterling was not having a good night. For reasons he couldn't begin to grasp, his life had become a nexus of misery. First, the snack machine down the hall from his office had eaten his last dollar. After pressing F4, he watched with hungry anticipation as the automated coil spun, slowly pushing the shiny bag of Doritos toward the glass, only to have it stop, a millimeter short of tumbling down into the dispensary. Sterling had shaken that cruel beast with ferocity, trying to get the bag free of its taunting grasp, but the snack machine had remained defiant. And now here he was, trudging with increasing fatigue across a frozen lake in the middle of a winter storm sometime after midnight with a knife lodged between his shoulder and his spine. Jim Sterling really wished he'd gotten those Doritos. It was just after 10 p.m. when his cell phone had started playing the Imperial March. Sterling had set that to be the ringtone for his ex-wife, Charlotte, so that he'd always know when it was her calling. It filled him with dread to hear that song. Sterling let the phone play for a good while before answering. Jim, it's Charlotte, she said calmly. Charlotte was always calm. Why shouldn't she be? Fifteen years ago, she got the house and the dog. Sterling got to keep the car and the TV. It was a nice TV, but it had fit better in their living room than in his rinky-dink apartment. Listen, it's about Thomas, Charlotte informed him. He's in the drunk tank down in Lakota. Sterling sighed. This was not an uncommon occurrence. The divorce had been rough on Thomas, Always little Tommy in his father's eyes. He had grown up to become Big Tommy. Big, drunk Tommy. Big, drunk, loud, brash Tommy. You need to go bail him out, Charlotte told him. Her voice sounded slightly muffled, probably puffing on a cigarette while sitting there in the kitchen of their house. Her house. In curlers and a bathrobe watching a rerun of that reality show she always enjoyed, the one where everybody was always running around half-naked and getting into arguments. I'm at work, Jim replied, and I got no car. Fair enough. And so, the second miserable moment of the night concluded. Sterling estimated at least five more were waiting for him down at the Lakota police station. Jim Sterling drove to Lakota, or rather... Jim Sterling started to drive to Lakota, but he never got there. Thinking back on it as he shambled across the ice with a quickly fading stride against an angry wind that licked the dry and cracking skin on his face, he came to a bitter conclusion. Jim Sterling was too goddamn nice. I'm going to die, he thought, here in the middle of this frozen fucking lake. I'm either going to collapse from exposure or bleed out thanks to this knife and get picked apart by coyotes. I should be in Lakota. Actually, I should be at the office, sipping a steaming cup of coffee and licking Dorito dust off my fingers. No. No, fuck that. I should be at home, watching whatever the hell is on Cinemax right now on that 
glorious goddamn TV, kicked back in my recliner and draining the last fifth of that vodka I have in the pantry. But he wasn't, because he was too goddamn nice. He had taken Norm Henderson's late shift on the phones because Norm had begged him, offering up the excuse that he wanted to drive his girlfriend with a weird Swedish name down to Sioux Falls to see a Led Zeppelin tribute band. Of course, that wasn't true. Norm was actually going with his other girlfriend with a weird Thai name, but he didn't want people around the office to know he had a side piece. Sterling knew Norm's secret because he was observant. At least, he prided himself on being so. But it would seem from the knife and the lake and his imminent demise that maybe Sterling wasn't quite as observant as he thought he was. Take, for example, his footsteps. Sterling could hear each heavy crunch as his boots packed down the snow covering the icy lake. But as he trudged with desperation toward nowhere in particular, he realized he could hear another set of heavy footfalls, following close behind, with a confident stride. Jim Sterling was being hunted. What had he done to deserve this? Stopped to help another human being in need? What possible sin had Sterling committed in the eyes of this pursuer? When you're driving down an empty road in the middle of a cold, dark winter night and you spot a vehicle pulled over with its hazard lights on, and a person hunched over one of the tires, isn't it good form to pull over and offer some assistance? Isn't it the North Dakotan way? Even if the person working the lug nuts looks to be approximately 300 pounds of hulking muscle, any good Samaritan would at least see if they need roadside assistance. And that's exactly what Sterling had done when he saw the rusty old pickup truck, pulled over by a snow embankment, hitched up on a jack with a giant of a man in a heavy brown coat beside it. He pulled up behind the seemingly broken down vehicle, hesitating for only a brief moment to think about little Tommy down at the drunk tank, and just how much of a delay it would put on him to help this individual. Sterling had felt the hair on the back of his neck prickle his collar when the man turned to look into his headlights. Something about the way he didn't blink or shield his eyes from the fluorescent beams. Just stared, expressionless, straight at him, as if measuring Sterling up. He leaned out the window. I have a phone if you want me to call AAA. Without a word, the man lumbered toward Sterling's car looking like a cross between a lumberjack and a grizzly bear. He seemed to be almost growing larger in stature with each step. Back in the deepest, darkest recesses of Sterling's brain, in the center for fight or flight, where his instinct for survival lived, a small voice cried out, Get out of there. A voice he hadn't heard since the day he made his vows to Charlotte at a little chapel in Las Vegas. Before he had a chance to react to it, the giant was at his door. The man had to hunch down to look inside the car, and in doing so, he filled the entire space of the window. His massive form seemed to be spilling into the car, great bushy beard first. Sterling slouched it down into his seat, stuttering but unable to find the right words. His phone. His phone was in the cup holder. He just needed to hand it to the man. That's all. The man was just there for the phone. After all, Sterling had offered it. Okay, so maybe the guy looked like that shaggy giant from Harry Potter. Sterling turned away just long enough to find the phone. But within seconds of turning his back, he felt the white hot pain of something sharp sliding into the meat between his shoulder blades. It happened so suddenly that he could barely comprehend why he heard it all. His first thought was not that he had just been stabbed, but that something in the way he shifted had thrown his back out. Ah, fuck! Sterling shouted, jerking away, fumbling further toward the passenger side of the car. Something sticking out of his back caught in the edge of the seat and sent more spasms of torture up his spine. He turned to look back at the man and saw one beefy hand drawing back through the window. Jesus Christ. Did he? Holy shit, he did! He stabbed me! That fucking gorilla just came over here and stabbed me through my window! Apparently, the man with the dead, expressionless eyes and hands so large they looked like they could palm Sterling's head and crush it like a cantaloupe 
wasn't satisfied with just stabbing a stranger. He meant to go all the way. 150% grade A homicide was etched on his face. He'd either get his stabbing instrument back from Sterling and use it again, or maybe just squeeze his neck until all the veins in his head burst like fireworks. So Sterling had run. It was not an elegant retreat, more like a trout trying to shimmy its way out of the cooler and back into the river. His right arm felt totally useless, and unfortunately, that was his favorite one. He barely managed to unbuckle himself at the left and ended up flopping his way across to the passenger side door, got it open, and tumbled out like a marionette. His assailant was not in a rush. If anything, he let Sterling go. Of course he did, Sterling thought. Where are you going to run to? There's nothing around for miles. But there was the lake. Devil's Lake, it was called. An apt name for the moment as Sterling began to question if maybe he just met the serpent himself. Across the lake, what looked like the lights of houses glowed in an almost welcoming fashion. If he could cross the ice, get to the homes, maybe someone could help. If only Sterling hadn't left his cell phone behind in the cup holder. That was ten minutes ago. Ten minutes of grueling agony burning in his back, his right arm hanging limply by his side, his legs feeling like jelly, and the vicious night wind ripping at his flesh. How far had he walked now? The lights of the houses seemed no closer than they had when he started. Was he imagining them? Sterling took a breath and looked back over his shoulder, feeling his muscles scream against the pain. The man was right there, just nine or ten strides away, a monstrous silhouette moving with unnatural swiftness against the brutal wind straight at Sterling. It was going to overtake him in seconds. Jim Sterling was six foot one, and this brute must now be seven feet tall or more. He couldn't make out the man's face, just a wild frenzy of hair concealing his features. His limbs had grown thicker, too. Sterling was sure of it. He now bore massive arms that strained against the brown coat. Even over the sound of the raging wind, Sterling could hear the seams of the man's clothing ripping as his body underwent some terrible metamorphosis right before his eyes. Jim Sterling was not above screaming. When he was little and his grandfather came to visit, the old man always tried to instill his antiquated values in little Jimmy. Every visit he educated him on how to act like a man, to never show fear or cry, to be brave against adversity. But when Granddad was gone, Sterling's mother and father raised him to be a human. He had wept at his father's funeral. And for little Tommy, when he realized how the boy had suffered through Jim and Charlotte's messy divorce, and he screamed now for the thing in the brown coat that charged at him with murderous intent. In the seconds before their bodies collided, the giant roared, not with the voice of a man, but with the deep, snarling, hungry roar of a beast. And as the shadowy muscular form plowed into Sterling's soft, yielding one, he did not look into the face of an angry, bearded trucker with some unexplained grievance, but that of a bear mixed with a mountain lion. Some unnatural thing that was neither one nor the other, and with a mouth wide and full of teeth. The eyes, only the cold lifeless eyes remained the same. It was a testament to the bitter freeze of that evening that man and monster didn't break through the ice of Devil's Lake. Sterling felt the wind knocked out of his lungs as the once man barreled into him with the momentum of a train engine, and then they both went down hard, Sterling only having just enough sense to roll to his left to keep from landing on his back and plunging the knife straight out the other side of him. He braced to be crushed by the weight of the thing that was a man as it came down on top of him, but it went right, rolling over beside him, thrashing menacingly in the snow. Sterling didn't have time to think. He barely had time to move. The thing in the snow beside him had claws and fangs and would be on its feet in seconds, 
ready to finish what it had started when it thrust its knife into his back. The knife. Sterling was a pushover, but he wasn't a fool. He knew well enough that at the moment the knife was the only thing keeping the blood inside his body, but he also knew it was his only weapon against this unearthly creature that had chosen to feast on him. He reached his good arm around behind his back, trying to find a grip on the handle. His fingers slipped against the wet wood, just barely touching it. But the flare-up of pain it shot through his other side almost made him want to curl up and surrender right there. Beside him, the beast rolled halfway over, snorting out a face full of powdery snow. It tensed up, further shredding the clothes it was wrapped in from its time as a man. Sterling slung his arm back behind his head, feeling his shoulder pop out of its socket with another excruciating shot of pain that summoned a need to scream deep in his gut before he bore down on it, holding it back for the moment lest he lose focus. The shoulder was an old injury from his days in the high school football team, but in that moment, it was a blessing. For the added flexibility it provided gave him just enough reach to wrap his hand around the knife's hilt and tear it free from his flesh. Then, and only then, did he give himself permission to scream. The man-beast was on its haunches, facing away for a second as it reoriented itself. The ice was slippery, and it seemed to take a lot of effort for the creature to not fall. It must have known that he had the potential to escape it if he got far enough out on the ice and put everything into catching him before that happened. Now it was at the mercy of its own footing. It swiveled around, bearing a massive fang-laden maw that seemed almost to sneer as it moved toward him. Come here, you bastard. Sterling surprised himself with a sudden surge of confidence. The knife in his hand gave him a fighting chance, but the hot blood leaking down the back of his coat gave him a time limit. It was here and now, or he knew it was over. Come on! I'll send you back to whatever hell you crawled out of! The beast got a foothold behind it, solid enough to pounce from, and it took it, lunging at Sterling with tooth and claw. He could see the heat of its breath on the air. The lifelessness in its eyes had been replaced with a frenzied bloodlust. Time seemed almost to freeze, as if the entire earth had stopped spinning in that instant. And then Sterling lurched toward the predator fist first, and their bodies slammed together again with a cry. After every shitty thing that had happened to him that night, Jim Sterling had a single stroke of luck. He lay in the snow, covering the frozen Devil's Lake, his arm halfway inside the mouth of a monster. The knife it had used on him in his car when it had the form of a man had driven up into the roof of its mouth and buried itself in the beast's brain. He lay there with it twitching beside him, feeling the hot gush of blood running down his arm, not for a second considering that a single spasm, one spark of its synapses, and it could bite his arm off at the elbow. He lay there feeling drained, looking up at the partially cloudy night sky as more flakes of snow drifted down to cover him and his trophy. But it wasn't over yet. He may have slain the beast, whatever it was, but it may very well have taken him with it. Sterling was freezing to death, and he didn't have the energy to get up and continue on. Some part of him, the part that was prone to giving up and giving in, told him to just roll over and die. He was the victor. Now he could rest. But there was another part of him, one that had long been dormant and now reawakened by his fight to the death. It screamed at him to fight. Jim Sterling had an idea. He'd seen it in a movie once, but thought it could work. Hell, it beat lying out there waiting to die of frostbite. He tightened his grip on the knife's handle and tugged, feeling the blade resist its new sheath in the monster's skull. Another yank and it slid free with a sigh. Holding his breath, Sterling hovered over the prone form of the monster, noting its exceptional size. It had definitely grown in stature as it transformed from man into beast. 
perfect. Sterling buried the knife in the creature's chest, then drew it out and stabbed it again and again. He sawed at it, slicing and ripping at the flesh. It yielded to the blade as easily as any of the bucks he had cleaned after hunting with his grandfather. It may have been monstrous in form, but it was still just another animal. At least Granddad taught me one thing useful, he thought, as he slit the man-beast from neck to groin. The smell that wafted from its corpse almost made him gag, but he had to suffer through it if he wanted to survive the night. Jim Sterling Father of little Tommy, a good Samaritan, with a bad stroke of luck, crawled inside the beast, feeling the squish of its insides as they shifted to make room. The heat of it enveloped him like a blanket. He figured it might not stay warm throughout the entire night, but it could be just enough. Maybe someone would drive by and see the two cars stopped and take a look and spot the massive form out on the lake. Maybe. Just maybe. Jim Sterling would live to see tomorrow. He closed his eyes and sighed. Back across the lake, a dozen headlights appeared pulling up next to those of his car that he had left on. Unfortunately, Sterling was tucked in safe and warm and would never see them. Nor would he see the multitude of silhouettes passing in front of the headlight's glare. Nor would he hear the angry howls as they set across the ice. Emily, Stan, and I enjoyed our grandmother's tales. During school breaks, Mom and Dad drove the three of us to her home in Plymerton. It was a small coastal village, an hour's drive north of Wellington. Everything about the place was tiny. It was simple. There were three cafes. There was a floral shop and a small dairy shop that served fish and chips on warm Saturdays. On each journey to our grandmother's house, the three of us glued our faces against the car windows. We watched as the tall, dark, looming shapes of the sawmills were replaced with empty flatlands. The rush of salt to our nostrils replaced the sawdust that rained constantly over our heads. The green sky followed us, though. Whether it was in Wellington or Plymerton, the sky was there to remind us. It wanted to tell us the truth that each and every one of us will turn to wood when we die. That was fine. The stories that our grandmother enjoyed telling us pictured a time before the curse of a wooden death struck every inhabitant of New Zealand's capital, Wellington. The strong winds that battered the city, we craned our little heads at each painting that decorated her walls. She had even showed a photo of herself as a young girl walking with two legs. By her storytelling days, however, our grandmother couldn't even move off of her chair. It was depressing. Who wanted to see their family member degrade into an immobile husk? Her condition was worse every visit. Grandmother's lower waist had been transformed into a thick bark. Her arms hung heavy on her sides. Her legs seemed to merge, even fuse, with the wooden floor of her home. Even her voice had started to sound croaky, like two boards rubbing together. Her condition grew worse each visit. Every time Mom and Dad told us that we were heading home, I wished, I hoped, and I prayed that we would get another chance to see our beloved grandmother. Emily, Stan, and I wanted to see more pictures. We wanted to listen to more tales of a Wellington long past. For Emily, she wanted to hear about the lifestyle. My brother Stan was fascinated with the landscape. I, for one, was curious about the museum, Te Papa. The Te Papa Museum was a wonderland, my grandmother described. She said that every day, different people from around the country and the world filled the museum to the brink. It was impossible to walk inside without bumping into five or a dozen people. 
Some days, she said, it was best to stand still and let the crowd guide you to your destination. The reason was simple. There was a lot to take in. Once a person stepped inside the museum, they were bound to be lost. Whether it was the natural exhibition on the second floor, New Zealand history on the third floor, or the Maori culture on the fourth floor, one simply could not walk around without stopping. My grandmother said that she could feel her pupils racing back and forth inside her eyes. Each pupil wanted to take in as much information that the museum provided. It was a giant building filled with laughter, joy, awe, and a great sense of local pride. I wished so badly to see what my grandmother had seen. The Tapapa had existed today was no more than an extravagant mausoleum. Its corners were sharp. The decapitated wooden heads of the museum curators looked down from the building's large wooden doors. The creamy brown paint that had once decorated the facade had been replaced with the wooden bodies of people. Each one was strung up against the others like dolls. It was disgusting. It was a mockery of the beauty that it had once been. Before my grandmother died, she had told us that she had forbidden herself from visiting the city. There was no point ever going back since the curse of the wooden death appeared. It would have simply made her depressed. Wellington was a husk of its former self. The current city was nowhere near like the beautiful windswept paradise of grandmother's stories. She had wished that one day the three of us would be alive to see Wellington in its glory days. Yet, even back then, I knew that the chances were already stacked against us. The side of my neck had already started to harden. The skin of my brother's back felt thick like bark. As for Emily, my youngest sister, I still cannot believe that she passed away. I remember the last time I saw her it was on a cold autumn night in May, a few days before her death. Emily and I went for drinks in the old Harbor and Sea bar in Lambton Key. It was a celebration. Emily had gotten a position as a receptionist for one of the largest sawmills in Wellington a 200-meter-tall behemoth at the center of the city. The pay was very good. Her hours were reasonable. She even got the option to take three weeks' worth of paid leave per year. I wasn't sure how Emily had managed to get the job. She had only completed a bachelor's degree in accounting and had a few temporary jobs at various call centers. Had she impressed a top dog from the sawmills? Had one of her friends given a good word to someone in the company? Or was it just plain luck? Whatever the case, Emily would be paid nearly as much as my position as a secretary for the city council. She would have been proud and excited. The Emily I knew could have yelled out to every person in the bar that she had secured a big gig. I was surprised, almost worried, to watch her lean down against the bar table. A half-empty cup spun in her hands. I never really enjoyed the thought of arranging people's wooden remains to be sent to the sawmills, she confessed. I jugged a glass, a hiccup. You can always give the position to me. I do anything to avoid crossing paths with that pig of a counselor, Jonathan Wales. But you have my pay? She slammed her palm on my back. Yeah. Nah, sis. I'm keeping it, thank you very much. Just because I hate the kind of work I must do doesn't mean I hate the pay. Plus, I heard that my table was crafted from the body of an all-black. My option still stands. Working for the city council will be great. I hiccuped again. The bartender with a wooden jaw passed me two glasses of water. Emily raised her cup. The bartender answered with another pour. It is traditional, anyway. Once I save enough money, I'll buy a huge property near Plymerton and set up a business where instead of chopping people up, we can make them, uh, I don't know, human trees? Oh, you're just trying to live like Grandma, eh? That's so cute. 
I said, drinking my glass. The house is still standing if you want it. Yeah, but no. Emily said with a smile as I caught a few guys staring idly at both of us from the far corner. You were always her favorite, I patted her shoulder. It had been twenty years since Grandma passed away. Emily was only six when Mom and Dad brought the three of us to the nearest sawmill to watch our dear Grandma be sawed and hacked to pieces. I guess I get why Grandmother exiled herself, she said, gulping her glass in one go. It is too depressing. I don't want to spend time in the city here any longer. I don't want to see mangled corpses in the middle of the streets. I don't want to watch them hauled onto the back of trucks or chopped up as firewood. I can always try being a model, I said as I hiccuped. You know, to cheer people up. Emily tilted her head. I was being serious there, I insisted. You can start by not being so gloomy all the time, Emily. Come on, cheer up. You'll start a new job next year. You'll be as rich in an instant. We can plan the celebration party now if you want. Let's leave all these problems for the future, Emmy. We have enough trouble as it is without thinking that we're going to end up as furniture. Plus, you still haven't had any physical trace of bark in you yet. So you're saying that actually you should become a model? She pushed her hair behind her ear. Am I really that, well, the sexy? The same guys in the corner glanced down at her soft, fleshy, long legs. Emily giggled, raising a glass up to her head. I hadn't realized that I was drop-dead attractive. Everyone, I apologize for looking so sexy. Maybe it was my looks that gave me a position as receptionist for a major sawmill. Emily, I groaned. She sat, head lowered, and cheeks puffed in pink. Sorry. Sorry, sis. Ego got the better of me. If it makes you happy, you're still my favorite sibling. You're not a dickhead like Stan. God, I hate our brother's guts. He thinks he's so great and mighty. I almost wanted to feel sorry when I heard that his back is turning to wood. Almost. It's everyone's burden. I called the bartender for another round. Seriously, just for once, I just want to know who or what did Wellington up so badly that it left us with a stupid curse. She muttered and let a lock of her blonde hair to fall over her face. Grandmother said that the god of the wind was defeated by the god of the forest. That's why everyone is turning to trees, I replied. That's why everyone is turning into trees. I wish it was that simple, Emily said. How do you kill off the god of the forest anyway? Wellington was better off when it was scorched with hundred-kilometer winds, like in the old days, you know. I sipped my glass, nodding. You're really not taking me seriously, eh, Natalie? Emily elbowed my shoulder. Anyway, after one more drink, I'll call it a night. You were right. We have enough shit to worry about. I'll do my best with my new job and work my way to get another property near Plemerton. I still have a few forms left to fill out tonight, though. Fuck, I hate doing this at the last minute. Don't forget to sleep early, I said pointedly. Of course, of course, she said and craned her neck back. I heard enough of that scolding from you and Stan to last a lifetime. I'm not going to sleep at 3 a.m. like I used to. 11 p.m. is my latest, that's a promise. I later found out that Emily indeed tried to keep her promise. It was overdose. That's what my brother, Stan, had told me over the phone. I felt my stomach lurch. My throat smelt like vomit when I learned that Emily had been found dead. A bottle of sleeping pills lay beside her bed. It was no surprise how she did it. At age 26, Emily Ritchie would have been another young victim. The local obituary would have labeled her as part of a growing number of people who wanted to escape the fate of watching their own bodies transform into a bark. Yet she hadn't. That was the worst part. 
When Stan relayed the information that our youngest sibling had died with no trace of wood in her body, I heard distinct cheering on the other end of the line. It sounded like 20 or 30 people laughing in the background. My brother told me that I should be happy that Emily had died this way. Normally, it would have taken no more than three hours before the corpse would resemble a mannequin. Even the morgue staff kept a 24-hour watch for any sign, any trace of bark inside or outside her skin. There was none. Emily had done it. She had beaten the impossible. At this point, I suppose I should say that I should have celebrated. My brother reminded me that Emily wouldn't have to face the towering sawmills that dwarfed every building in the city. The thought of my youngest sister being chopped into pieces and turned into furniture was whisked away. There was no longer any need to worry about that. Emily will be safe. She will be preserved. She will be the new chosen one who will be displayed among the decaying corpses within Te Papa. All my relatives cheered out at the news that one of our own had beaten the wooden curse. The city council was quite quick to proclaim the good news to the people. Not only had they given us $100,000 as a gesture of gratitude, but they set up a new exhibition at Te Papa, all as a token to Emily's death. In the beginning, Tohiri, the Maori god of the winds, waged war against his brothers. He attacked Tain, the god of the forest, and forced the god of the sea to wage war against the former. The gods of food took refuge and hid from Tohiri's onslaught. It was only the god of war, Tumatetwenga, that stood a chance and forced the god of winds to withdraw. Ever since that day, my grandmother had said that Wellington was Tori's home. It was obvious. Wellington had been considered as the windiest city in the whole country. The strong 100-kilometer gale force that could batter numerous towns in New Zealand was an everyday occurrence that everyone had gotten used to. A day within Wellington wouldn't be complete without watching an army of thick, giant clouds spiraling around the city like a whirlpool. Those were Tuahiri's children. The winds and the clouds were the god's army against his brothers. Tuahiri commanded them to storm the seas. He ordered his children to uproot trees and scatter the crops off the ground. Whether the god of wind was defeated by an alliance of his brothers or not was uncertain. It was always obvious that their presence was now gone. Wellington was no longer the windiest city in the country. It was dry, but still, like some forgotten ruin left to decay on its own. The great fleet's two clouds that had once proudly sailed the city had been replaced by an inky, dark green sky. The showers of sawdust that poured out from the sawmills took over from the winds. The only trace that Tohiri and his children were ever here being faint, fleeting clouds in the shape of a silent scream. There were quiet breezes. A gust came and went. Pitter-patter of rain held on for a morning. Yet none of them shook off the dry, humid weather that had devoured the city. There was no god to welcome me to the first day of Emily's exhibition. Only Stan. Kiora, Natalie. I'm glad to see that the curse hasn't taken you yet. My brother greeted me at the museum's entrance. His brown hair, which had once tried to grow, was shortened. He combed it back, revealing a wooden crack on his forehead. He'd grown bulkier since the last time I'd seen him, almost stiff. Maybe it was the large brown jacket that he wore. It was May, after all, and winter was just around the corner. I could already sense, almost smell, the roasted wooden bodies, who were chosen to be firewood for Wellington. It's good to see you again, Stan. I hugged him, feeling the hardness of the wood that consumed his back. How are you keeping up? How's the family? They're doing great. The kids are being babysit now. I don't think they have realized that their Auntie Emily has died. They heard about her becoming the city's nearest darling, 
but they still don't get that people need to die to achieve that honor. I brought my wife, though. She's upstairs with the rest of the family. Mom and Dad must be gushing here about the gang feeds. And you, I asked, how is your condition going? You sound like I'm going to die, Nat. This is your brother you're talking to. It's all sorted out. A local carpenter told me that even though my back has been taken over, I won't have to worry for a decade or two until the curse takes me. My wife, at the goth, has scheduled me an appointment with a cabinet maker. I swear that I married the most awesome woman in the city. He paused, placing a hand on my shoulder. I felt the tip of a finger rubbing the thick bark on the side of my neck. I realize that it's hard for you to be here, Nats. I don't think I'm ready to see Emily's dead body, and the last thing I wanted to do was join some sick party. I'm only here because the rest of the family's here. You know me, Stan. You can't stand being the oddball. I'm not surprised. You're the motherliest type between the three of us. But that's fine. That's fine. Emily is the spoiled little princess, while I'm the more, well, let's just say, extravagant? Show off? To cut him off. Seriously, Stan. Did you really put on a show when you called me that day? I can't believe you. I know that you and Emily didn't get along well, but that... Really? My colleagues decided to come over after work for a few beers, he said, and shrugged. Right. Right, and they started shouting, Emily will decay because... Because that's what people do when they hear that someone has beaten the curse. He placed an arm around my shoulder and led me inside the entrance hall of the museum. The place was empty except for a headless wooden body at the center. It's pointed its arms toward a stack of stairs in front of us. The figure's stump was bathed by the warm blue lights of the ceiling. The low hum of the air conditioner drowned the buzzing sound of the sawmills from outside. I could even see a faint flicker of a fire off the Wellington Harbor and the shadows of trucks near the docks. Soon, the Lambton Parade will be on its way. Deemed unworthy or useless by the sawmills will be spread across the city. I can also imagine, almost here, an army of Wellingtonians marching toward the streets with axes and machetes, all ready to be hacked by their former city folk as firewood. For now, it was too quiet. I felt as if I had stepped inside an empty church dedicated to the holy decaying bodies of Wellington City, each wall dedicated to a painting or a photograph of Wellington in its glory days. I wondered if the people in these pictures knew what the future of this city would be like. Their smiling faces and quiet laughs were different from the sighs and grindings that I saw every day. Were there any signs of Tohiri's defeat back then? Grandmother told us that the city was unaware of any warning that would bring its downfall. Maybe there was none. Maybe everything that is happening now was beyond our limit. Maori gods have done this to us. Maybe they would fix it, my grandmother used to say. We can only hope. Where's the rest of the family? I asked as I scratched the wooden bark of my neck. They're on the fourth floor. That's where the exhibition will take place. Mom and Dad got a bit worried that you weren't here yet and asked me to fetch you, knowing you'll be conflicted over Emily. You won't believe how many people turned up for this day. I don't even know most of them, or how they're related to us. Oh, I wish Grandma was here to see this. I whispered. You think she'd be proud? Stan asked as we climbed the wooden stairs, passing over a series of old photos of the Papa Museum in its glory days. She would still be rooted in her old home in Plymerton. She had said that she was in self-exile. I like to think that Grandma would make an exception, he said. Emily always was her favorite. She used to give her the first taste of the cookies since she was the only one small enough to sit on her lap. I remember how you and I used to fight for that position. We even made numerous alliances to get Emily off Grandma's special list. 
a smirk, catching glimpses of dark silhouettes of the sawmills from the window. I bet she wasn't planning to die that night. Stan said as he chipped off a piece of bark from his head. Emily was a klutz. I bet she must have taken one pill too many. I told her to stop that, he said. Well, you can't really blame all of it on yourself, Matt. It's Emily's fault for drinking all those energy drinks non-stop during university. We kept warning her that it would affect her sleeping pattern, but that girl was too stubborn and pretentious to listen. Just because she was pretty doesn't mean she had common sense. Do you remember how she caught me taking away her valuable caffeine drinks? I forced a smile. Emily ranted a whole night saying how you were the worst brother ever. She even avoided me for a whole month, he chuckled. I ruined that by popping by her place one night. Oh, that girl wasn't keen to see me. And now Emily's dead, I clenched my fist. Stan, I, I was with her a few days before she passed away. If I had known something was wrong or if she had told me about her sleeping problems, I could have... There was nothing we could do. We could, I said. I was there. Natalie, my brother, gripped my arm. Please, enough. You're not the only one who's grieving. I may not look like it, but I miss Emily as well. We used to hate each other's guts. I swear our brother's sister rivalry was a bloody comedy scratch. But now that she's gone, I'm not even sure what to do. Stan, he continued, eyes narrowed. Did you want to see her being turned into timber, Natalie? I can still remember how men in white uniforms took our grandmother's wooden body and turned her into a piece of chair. I still have nightmares thinking about her body, how it was hacked by a buzzsaw. Seriously, Nat, who would want a grave like that? No one. Be happy, Nat, please. It's too late for us already. We will face those damn sawmills one day. But Emily, she will be here as long as time passes. She will be a model, a light for everyone who faces the chainsaws. I smiled a little. It was ironic, almost a sick parody, that my advice to Emily in becoming a model rather than a receptionist came true. A beautiful young body would be displayed for all people to see. I imagined the public gawking with wide eyes as they approached her. It was no surprise. Those who had achieved the state of natural death were people either in their 70s or late 80s. It was rare, almost unheard of, for someone so young to defeat the curse of a wooden death. The youngest person before Emily was a 40-year-old man, who was found drowned off the coast of Red Rocks. Since then, it's been elderlies. It was clear that the city folk were baffled. Prior to the exhibition, the city council declared that Emily's body was a rank one relic. Rather, to have her body slowly decay, like most of the inhabitants of the museum, she would be perfectly preserved. She will be a still frame. Generations into the future, people will ask the museum staff who she was. How had she done it? What did she eat? What was her secret? I'll be pissed if the local news reports a huge sale in sleeping pills. If that happens, I'm going to whomever made the report and tell them just because my sister had defeated the curse doesn't mean that people know everything about her. It's already bad enough that our youngest sister will permanently reside within the wooden walls of this museum. When I was a young girl, I played a game called Headhunter. The rules were simple. For every visit to the museum, my classmates and I aimed to count as many heads as we could find. It was an easy game since there were countless faces that jutted off each stack of timber. We gave one point for the heads with blank expressions. Two points went for the faces who were sad or afraid, and finally, a total of three points for those with a smile and a frozen semblance of laughter etched in their wooden faces. It was a fun game, 
Most children and some of my teachers were happy to sacrifice an hour for a few rounds of headhunting. My biggest record was 206. I was slightly tempted to try and beat the number as Stan and I made our way upward. The faces that I had counted when I was 14 were mostly gone. That was the beauty of the headhunting. Every year, a hundred or two of these wooden boards were replaced. It was always fun darting around the tall, steep walls of the museum to find new faces that hadn't been there before. The constant smell of decay and the sight of peeling flesh from old bodies that suffocated the second and third floors was nowhere near the thrill of finding a new face. I wished I had that same excitement when Stan and I reached the museum's fourth floor. Boarded shut by thick wooden panels, the top floor of the museum was the beating heart of Tapapa. It was the holiest of places for Wellington City, a site where a selected few were granted the right to be a still image forever. Though it wasn't exactly closed to the public, a normal person wants to pay a hefty $300 ticket, and even that was limited for only three hours. I'd been there once as part of my work with the city council. It was a short visit. I think it was only a half hour at most, but even then, I could still picture myself basking under a soft white and yellow glow from the ceiling. The floor was white. The scent of sweet incense lifted me off my feet. Kinukutu, Kinukutu, Kinukutu Katua. Greeting to the families, the proud families of Wellington's newest treasure. The pot-bellied figure of Councillor Jonathan Wales stood on top of a makeshift stage. A giant statue of Tahiri, the god of the wind, stood silently behind him. The councillor welcomed an army of wooden bodies below him. It was a mangled contortion of wood and flesh that ruined the serenity of the fourth floor. Branches sprouted from necks, whole legs were entombed by soft carpets of algae, and the army cheered. They shouted my sister's name over and over, raising their arms and craning their heads back. I rubbed the hardest part of my neck. Nails tried to claw the bark from my flesh. I felt sick. The thought that I would join this army was unimaginable. I wanted to get out of the building at that very moment. I didn't want to see the perverted sight in front of me. I didn't want to listen to wood cracking and turning. My grandmother was right. Emily was right. There was no point staying in the city that was a shadow of itself. I didn't want to see my boss running his bony fingers over a large curtain-covered glass case beside him. He caressed it. He lifted the bottom part a few centimeters up before letting go. Each moment, he described the beauty of Emily Reach. He told everyone that she was a prize worth dying for, how her flesh was serene, soft. You want to touch her hair? To rub her lips? You wish to whisper to her ear that she is beautiful. Why, why? The counselor shouted. His bloated belly hugged the case as the crowd cheered. This is our city's newest treasure, our Puipuyaki, Emily Riche, Tindarawa Atukwe. Thank you very much. He paused. His beady eyes scanned the room before he rubbed his head. He lowered his voice. And, no, 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 I almost forgot. (laughs) We cannot celebrate the Rerahwa, the beauty of our beloved daughter without thanking her parents, the Kwana, that gave her to us, Nuaumai Hiramai. Stan grabbed my arm at this point as Mom and Dad walked up to the stage. Their bodies were woody and stiff, their heads were the only part themselves untouched by the curse. Yet they smiled. Their faces were covered with tears, knowing their wish, their hope, that one of us would defeat the curse had come true. Let's go, Natalie, Stan said, walking forward. His breath was ragged, his eyes were glued, 
to the glass case upon the stage. Stan became a man possessed. I could tell that he badly wanted to see what was behind the curtain. He didn't mind if he walked straight through the army, bumping, crashing, and bruising both of us against the hard surface of our wooden family. I wanted to tell him to stop. I wanted to beg him to slow down. He was hurting me. There was no need to rush. There was time. The city council had informed us that Emily's immediate family would have unlimited free access to the fourth floor as gratitude. I wanted to protest, but all I could muster were gasps. The back of my neck became flustered, almost hot. In the back of my mind, a little voice told me to celebrate. It told me that I could once again see my dear sister, that the three of us will be united, and as Stan and I reached the front, wooden hands pushed us forward. I fell on my knees, only to look up at the beautiful, nude corpse of my youngest sister. I opened my mouth. The uniform gasp of all my relatives conquered whatever words I mustered. She's beautiful, declared the voice in my head. Emily Rich is beautiful, I repeated, my face now fully infected by the wide, toothy smile of everyone around. Tenahawa Atukwe. Jake Thomason pulled the sleeve of his sweatshirt down, covering his hand, and wiped away the condensation from the window. It was the third time he had done this in the past ten minutes, but he didn't want to miss seeing if any cars drove by outside. He was sitting on his knees on the family couch, elbows propped against the back of it, and leaning forward, his small face almost pressed against the window. He was so close to it that he could feel the cold radiating from it, even though it was nice and warm in the house. On the floor by the couch was his red Transformers backpack, with a pencil case full of crayons, an index card with his home address and phone number written on it, his baseball cap, and a three-day-old apple inside. He was humming the tune to I Dream of Jeannie absentmindedly, not loud enough to cover the sound of the television from the kitchen in the next room. Jake wasn't listening to the TV, nor was he listening to the snippets of his parents' muted and tense conversation that drifted out of the kitchen. It was light in the kitchen, but the only illumination in the living room was from the large picture window that Jake was looking out of, wrapped. The world outside was a near-perfect white, and the dim daylight crept in like a ghost, bringing silence and mystery with it. Jake had lived in this house for all of his five years, and knew the outside street as well as he knew anything. He knew the front porch, which was painted a brick red color. He knew the steps that led down past the yard. He knew the plastic kiddie pool that was up every summer, and which he had used as recently as last week. He knew the cracks in the sidewalk beyond, and he knew to never, ever go off the sidewalk into the street, because that's where the cars drove, and a car could run him over. He knew the houses across the street, where the Laramies lived and the Alvarezes, and his friend Bobby Guilliford and his parents. Now, however, he didn't recognize any of these familiar sights. There was only snow. The snow had drifted up onto the porch, and the only red paint still visible was on the columns supporting the overhang. The steps, sidewalk, and road were indistinguishable from each other, except for a row of intermittent bulges that marked the parked cars at the edge of the roadway. The pool was just a slight mound on the right side of the area where the lawn used to be. Beyond that, the drifting flurries obliterated everything. Bobby Guilliford could be standing in his front yard across the street, playing with his juggling balls, and Jake would never know. In fact, Jake hadn't seen anyone for a day or two now. The snow had started four days ago on August 20th, and there were still people driving for the first day and then walking around for a bit longer. But the snow had just kept coming, 
and eventually Jake stopped seeing anyone outside. That didn't stop him from looking, though. In his mind, he kept expecting to see the splash of headlights come down the street, followed by the bright yellow of the school bus that he'd been waiting for. The bus would stop in front of his house, and he'd run out with his backpack and get on board, seeing all of the other kids huddled up in coats and scarves and gloves. Bobby would be there, and so would a whole bunch of other kids that Jake had never met before. The bus driver would smile at him, and the doors would close, and the bus would take him across town to his first day of school. His first day, which should have been two days ago. Jake wasn't too young to realize how strange it was to have snow this close to the end of summer. He had known this on his own, but it was confirmed when he overheard his dad on the phone the day before saying that it was fucking unnatural. Jake's mother had seen Jake listening and told his dad to watch his language, but Jake's dad didn't like that, and they had spent the rest of the day yelling at each other. This wasn't out of the ordinary, not fucking unnatural, Jake thought, but they had seemed more easily angered since the snow had started. Jake didn't have the vocabulary to describe how it was different now, but he was very in tune with his parents' emotional barometers, and he was happy to spend his time sitting in the living room and looking out the window. Except now, he was hungry. He knew that he had the apple in his backpack, but he didn't want to eat it. Jake enjoyed apples, but if he ate the one in his backpack, then he wouldn't have one if the school bus happened to come by right then, and he didn't want to go to his first day of school unprepared. Besides, he was finally getting restless after sitting here all day. He turned around on his knees and shuffled off of the couch to make his way to the kitchen. As he walked through the doorway, he saw his parents sitting at the small, round table, watching the news on the portable black-and-white television that had permanent residence on the counter. His mom had a lit cigarette in her hand, forgotten, and his dad was holding a half-empty bottle of beer. There was an empty glass on the table near his mom. Neither were looking at him. Mom, I'm hungry, Jake said, and both of his parents jumped a little, startled. A small splash of beer spilled out of the bottle in his dad's hand, wetting his blue jeans. Shit, his dad muttered and pushed back from the table, glowering briefly at Jake. What are you doing creeping around? I just want something to eat. The bus isn't here yet. The bus isn't going to... His dad started, but then stopped. He looked at Jake for a moment his expression irritated, and then softened a little. Your mom will make you something to eat. I, I gotta go change my pants. He glanced at Jake's mom and then turned and went out of the small kitchen. Both Jake and his mom looked after him for a moment as he walked down the hall towards the back of the house. How's a peanut butter sandwich sound, kid? Jake turned to his mom and then looked at the clock hanging on the wall. He wasn't very good at telling time yet, but he knew that it was later than lunchtime. Isn't it time for dinner? he asked. Jake's mom appeared startled as she followed his gaze to the clock. Shit, she muttered and then quickly glanced back at Jake. Sorry, she said. Can we have noodles? Jake asked. His mother took a drag off her cigarette and then ground it out in the ashtray on the table. Sure, Jake, she said, walking over to the cabinet. Jake turned his attention to the television, but caught his mom say, not too much left besides noodles anyway, under her breath. The man on the news was sitting in a studio, talking about the snow. The news was boring to Jake, but he sat down in his dad's chair, rested his chin in his hands, elbows propped on the table, and waited for his mom to cook dinner. Jake sat in the living room, wrapped in a blanket and slumped down with his chin resting on the back of the couch. His backpack was still on the floor where it had been the day prior. He was looking out the window again. The snow was higher now, piled up to the point that he could see a few inches of it above the bottom edge of the glass. The bumps that represented the parked cars were still visible, but harder to make out now. The snow was slowing, but Jake could barely catch glimpses of anything beyond the roadway. He could see a little bit of the houses across the street, but didn't see any lights so their power must be out too. When Jake had woken up early that morning, the house was cold and dark. 
The electricity had gone out sometime during the night. He had gotten out of bed and walked groggily to his parents' room. The door was open and they were still asleep. He crawled into bed with them and must have drifted off again because it was suddenly later and they were gone. He could hear them yelling at each other in the kitchen. It was bad. Jake usually went outside when it was like this, but he couldn't go outside now. He turned over in their bed and pulled the covers up, trying to block out the sound. Well, what the fuck do you expect me to do, Linda? I can't go out there and the phone isn't working. I don't know, but we have to do something. We've only got food for a few more days. Yeah, because that's what you really want me to go get for you. How dare you? You're the only one allowed to have a drink in the evening. Or the morning or the afternoon. God, you are such an asshole. We are running out of food, Jim. The snow isn't stopping and we don't have much left to eat. But now the snow was stopping, and Jake sat on the couch and watched the last of it as it drifted down from the blank sky. He was still looking for the school bus, but it was more out of habit than anything at this point. There were no tire tracks on the road, no footsteps or animal tracks either just an unblemished white that was as high as he was tall. Besides the dwindling snowflakes, there was no movement outside, no sound, no nothing. Jake desperately wanted to go to school. It wasn't just the thought of new friends and an exciting new place, but it was a chance to have something be different. In all of the shows, classes started on time and the teachers kept things in order and things just made sense. If he had been older, Jake would have said that the reliability of school was what he was yearning for, something with structure and dependability that he had been craving for his whole life. Inside the house, there were occasional sounds coming out of the kitchen, something like a drinking glass on wood. That meant his mother was in there, but he didn't know where his father was. Probably in the bedroom. Jake pulled the blanket tighter around himself, shivering a little, and continued to stare out through the window. Jake woke up the next morning to the sound of his mother screaming hysterically. He bolted up, not sure where he was. He had slept in his parents' bed the night before, but the darkness and sudden jarring wakefulness were disorienting. He jumped out of bed and almost tilted over, still not fully awake. He barely registered how cold it was in the house. His mother wouldn't stop screaming, and he could now hear his dad trying to get her to be quiet. You're going to wake him up, now shut up! Jake ran out of the bedroom, knocking his shoulder against the door jamb in the process. The screaming was coming from the living room, and he found his parents there. His dad was holding his mom in a tight hug, restraining her as she was desperately trying to escape his embrace. He was wearing his denim jacket, and his mom was wearing what looked like two pairs of pajamas. They were in the center of the room, but she kept turning her head back towards the picture window as his dad tried to keep her from looking out. He was making shushing noises and telling her not to wake Jacob. "'What's going on?' Jake asked. His dad turned to him, and in his distraction, Jake's mom twisted out of his grasp and flew towards the window. She leaned over the back of the couch, staring desperately outside. Jake had a moment to think that she was exactly where he had been a few days before, and then his mom started yelling again. Jesus Christ, do you see it? Do you see it? Do you? Linda! Jake is here, his dad bellowed and Jake's mom stopped flinching. Jake stood in the doorway, looking at his parents, and started to cry a little. What's happening? What's wrong? Christ, now I have to deal with this too, his dad said, but his mother had apparently sobered a little, and she came over to comfort Jake. It's okay, sweetie, she said, trembling slightly as she knelt down and hugged him. Jake was crying openly now, scared and cold. It's okay, Jakey. Mommy and Daddy are just really wanting the snow to go away. What did you see outside? Jake asked between sobs. Nothing, baby, nothing, his mother said, 
But Jake felt her head lift from where it had been against him, and he knew that she was looking at his father. Jim, she said. What? he replied, frustrated. Jake felt his mother sigh deeply against him, and then she picked him up. How about we all go into the kitchen and have some breakfast? How's some cereal sound, Jake? Jake kept crying but managed to nod his head. She carried him into the kitchen and put him down in a chair at the table. When his father entered a few moments later, his mom went over and the two whispered together. Jake was still crying but thought he heard her say, Don't let him look out the window. After a breakfast of cereal, with no milk, they spent the day in the kitchen, playing cards and layering on clothing to try to stay warm. Jake would have enjoyed it if his parents hadn't kept glancing out towards the living room, obviously distracted. Sometime later, before it got dark, they both had a drink, and then another, and more after that, until everything was gone. Then they started arguing, and Jake left the kitchen for his bedroom, where he lay in his bed and listened to them yell at each other. After a while, he slept. Jake awoke in the night, hungry and needing to use the bathroom. He walked past his parents' room on the way to the toilet and saw his dad asleep in their bed, still wearing his day clothes. His mom wasn't there. Jake went into the kitchen, where he saw his mother slumped in a chair, leaning on top of the table, lightly snoring. Jake stood there for a moment, feeling a multitude of emotions that he didn't know how to process, and quietly started to cry again. Still crying, he walked to the bathroom and went pee, and then started back to his bedroom. Halfway there, he stopped listening to the silence of the house and the world outside. It was cold, very cold now, and he wanted to get back into bed, but there was something else he had to do first. He was done crying, but his nose was still running, and he wiped it with his sleeve as he turned around and started towards the living room. He was walking stealthily now. Neither of his parents had woken when he was moving around the house a few minutes earlier, but now that he was doing something that he knew he wasn't supposed to, he was scared that one of them would wake up and be angry. Making his parents angry was at the very top of Jake's list of things that he didn't want to have happen. He crept back down the hall, passing the open door to the bedroom and entering the kitchen. His socks had been silent on the carpet of the hallway, but some of the floorboards in the kitchen creaked from time to time and he was careful to step very lightly. Even so, his mother shifted in her chair as he walked past, and Jake jumped a little. When she settled back, he went the rest of the way through the kitchen and into the living room. It was very dark, but the snow outside seemed to cast a faint light into the room. Jake walked slowly to the couch. The snow had stopped the day before, but was still piled high enough that he couldn't see across it while standing on the floor. He climbed up onto the couch and stood up, pressing his hands against the cold glass and looking out across the yard and towards the houses across the street. There were still no lights on in them. There was no movement of any kind. What had made his mom so upset? Jake looked around for a minute, not seeing anything. He was turning to get off the couch and go back to bed when something caught his eye. It was on top of the snow, just at the edge of the window and to the side. Jake hadn't seen it at first because he had been looking past the snow, not at it. Jake stood there motionless, his heart speeding up and his eyes wide. He was shivering now, but not just from the cold. He was aware that he needed to not make any noise, or he would wake up his parents, but he was starting to breathe heavily, and knew that he wouldn't be able to stay quiet for much longer. He stumbled off the couch, and ran as silently as he could back to his room. He jumped into bed, pulled the covers up as high as they would go, 
and started to sob into his blankets. He stayed that way for over an hour until fear, hunger, and anxiety exhausted him and he drifted into an uneasy sleep, dreaming of the four clawed footprints that led up to the front window and then away from it, and the small puddle of frozen blood that was pooled against the glass. The next two days passed without incident. His parents fought. There wasn't any food left. Jake tried to fit himself into the unseen cracks of their new life. Jake woke up to a smell that he wasn't expecting. Bacon. He stumbled out of bed and walked, bleary-eyed, into the kitchen. His mom was at the counter, cooking on a small propane camping stove. His dad was sitting at the table, drinking a cup of coffee and smoking a cigarette. Mom? Jake asked, rubbing his eyes. His mom turned a smile on her face, but it faded when she saw him. She stopped looking at him until his dad muttered, Want to get Jake some bacon, honey? He wasn't looking at Jake. Yes, she said strangely, and then again with more conviction. Yes, here, Jake. And she pulled four thick strips of bacon from the hot griddle. The smell was amazing, and Jake realized that his mouth was watering like a cartoon wolf. Jake sat down at the table and tore into the bacon. As he was finishing, his mom placed three more strips on his plate. Jake looked up and started to say, thank you, like he had been taught, but his mother quickly turned away when he caught her gaze. Jake kept on eating his bacon, but he was aware that the mood had sombered since he arrived. His mother continued to cook, and his father was still drinking coffee, but it was otherwise silent in the kitchen. Mom, where did the bacon come from? There was a bang as his mother slammed the fork in her hand down against the countertop. Jake froze. Something was very wrong here. Can't you just be happy? His mother said. She had both hands planted on the counter, her shoulders tense. Can't you just be fucking happy? Hey, Linda, Jake's father started. No! His mother yelled, spinning around and facing them. The fork in her hand pointed accusingly towards Jake. We haven't had anything to eat for days, and you can't just be happy that there's food here? You have no idea what we had to do for this. No idea! I'm sorry, Mom, Jake began, but it was too late. No, it's ruined now, she yelled. She slid the propane stove to the edge of the counter and swept the remaining bacon into the sink with the fork. Hey, what the hell? Jake's dad shouted. He stood up angrily. Why the fuck did you do that? But he got no answer. Jake's mom slumped slowly to the floor, crying. His dad stood where he was for a moment and then said, Fuck this. He looked at Jake and started to turn to go, but then stopped. You did this to her, he said, looking back over his shoulder, and then something that confused Jake further. I'm not even sorry, you know that? Not sorry a bit. And he stomped down the hall, slamming the bedroom door behind him. Jake sat stunned and terrified. His mom huddled on the floor by the sink, sobbing loudly. After a minute, Jake grabbed the remaining bacon from his plate and walked slowly into the living room. He sat on the couch and chewed, numbly, until the food was gone. When he was done, he curled up on the couch and looked out the window at the silent world beyond. After a while, he started crying himself. Slowly, he drifted off to sleep, but not before noticing a fresh set of clawed tracks leading up to the window. There was no set of retreating prints this time. Jakey, wake up. Jake shifted on the couch, where he was curled into a small ball. He had been dreaming of someone scratching on the front door. Jake, come on, you have to get up now. His mother talking to him. Jake opened his eyes. Mom? Yes, Jake, it's time to get up. Come on, now. 
Jake looked around. The house was dark. It was sometime during the night. Both of his parents were standing by the couch looking down at him. His father was holding Jake's jacket that he had worn last winter. What's going on? His mother again, sterner now. Jake, I told you, it's time to get up. Now get up. He pulled himself into a sitting position, confused and half awake. His father handed his jacket to him. Come on, Jakey. You gotta put your jacket on. It's time to go. What? It's time to go. Time to go to school, Jake. This woke Jake up fully. Huh? He said and turned to look out the window. It was just as it had been the last few days. The snow covered everything. There was no light, no movement. Where's the bus? He asked, still looking out the window. It's coming, baby, his mom said. Now put on your jacket and get ready. Jake stood unsteadily and put his jacket on. He looked down at his backpack. I ate my apple. What? His father. My apple, the one in my backpack. I ate it a few days ago. I need one to bring to school. His parents exchanged glances. My jacket doesn't fit anymore, Jake said, stretching his arms out, the sleeves only coming to his mid-forearm. Oh, it's okay, sweetie, his mom said, kneeling down and trying to pull his sleeves down to his wrists. You just needed to get from here to the bus, and there will be lots of food at school. It was dark in the house, and Jake couldn't see her face clearly, but there was something glimmering on her cheeks. But it's nighttime, Mom. There's no school at night. His father abruptly turned around and walked out of the room. Jake's mom made a sound that might have been a sob, but when she spoke, her voice was bright. Well, with all of the school everyone missed, they're having a night class so you all can catch up. What? No more questions, Jake, his mother said, suddenly harsh. You've been waiting to go to school all week, and now you don't want to go. I can't believe you. She stood up and looked down at him. Well, I don't know if they'll want you now with you acting this way and all. She crossed her arms. No, Mom, I do. I really do, Jake wailed, now distraught as well as confused. It might be too late for that. I don't think the school will want an ungrateful child like you. Please, Mom, Jake said, now starting to tear up. Please, I really want to go. I want to meet everyone. Really? Yes, please, Mom. Jake looked up at her, pleadingly. A moment passed. Jake thought he heard his mother crying, too. <sighs> okay, his mother said. But you have to go right now. The bus will be here very soon. She took Jake by the arm and walked him to the front door. My backpack, Jake said. You don't need... His mother started, but then stopped, looking at him. Of course. You can't forget your backpack now, can you? She walked back to the couch to retrieve it, and then returned to Jake. She stood for a moment, looking down at him and clutching the Transformer's backpack to her chest. Mom? She knelt down and helped him put it on, and then hugged him fiercely. I love you, Jakey. Please remember that, she said, and then the dam broke and she started sobbing loudly, still holding him to her. Mom, what's going on? What's wrong? Jake asked, crying himself. His mom released him and stood, wiping her eyes. Nothing, sweetie, nothing. She took a deep, shaky breath and then released it. <sighs> okay, baby, it's time to go, she said and reached past him to open the door. As she did so, a drift of snow fell in across the carpet, but not before Jake realized that the carpet was already covered in a dirty swath of white. Before he could ask about this, his mother was helping him up on top of the snow. It was just firm enough for him to stay on top of it without sinking too deeply. Still, as he started to sink, he panicked and turned back towards his mother. Mom? He said desperately, but she was already closing the door. 
Jake could hear her crying as she did so. The latch clicked shut, and Jake was suddenly alone in the dark, silent world. He stared at the door, confused and scared. The breath he pulled in was cold, and he could feel his tears tracing frigid tracks down his cheeks. He crouched there, half in the snow and leaning on the door for several minutes. He didn't care about school anymore. He didn't care about the bus, which he knew wasn't coming. He just wanted to go back. Back inside. Back to the week before when none of this had happened. Back to when things weren't scary. He cried outside, alone in the snow. He cried until he heard the sound of light footsteps swiftly approaching from the darkness. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, reminding you that if you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or a thumbs down vote. New entries will be posted throughout the month. Be sure to tune in and vote for each of them and help decide who becomes the next evil idol. Until next time, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.